has uh, endorsed is overall it has a beneficial effect or is likely to have a beneficial effect to recreation and tourism simply because as has been demonstrated we have a number of significant breaches and risks uh, and this is an overall uh, enhancement to the offer uh, of the area protecting a number of specific sites as well as the homes and jobs albeit you know, Clarence Pier is not protected specifically uh, in this scheme uh, but overall we're satisfied that it has a, a positive implication for the use of the South Sea Common Area and the South Sea Seafront. I have Councillor Udi, Councillor, Ad, uh, Councillor Atkins, Councillor Pitt and then some questions from me. I'm Councillor sorry Udi. but this might not be a question, it's more of a, an extension on Councillor Hunt's point. The Portsmouth plan precedes quite a major UK festival that happened on the seafront so I need to talk about tourism because it's massively increased in Portsmouth and I feel like this kind of plan would be to save tourism in a way I guess I'm mitigating those things but when you're saying you're looking at um, a study about how it's going to impact tourism in the area well if it's underwater we're going to lose a lot of time tourism Councillor Hunt sorry Councillor Atkins Sorry, yes, because the microphone came forgetting. A few questions about height changes at various points. How, how high is the band over existing around Clarence Pier? So behind Clarence Pier was going to be this quite complex arrangement of new earthworks. How, how tall are they uh, relative to current, current uh, land height? Do you know? Um, Just roughly, it doesn't have to be precise. And that's because the, the technology... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's not uniformly I flat, I quite understand. And this is what I look for, the, the partnership to shape their heads. Uh, I, I, I'm essentially kind of asking, yeah. if, it, use your mic. if I was walking along the pavement, am I going to feel like this is above my head height or my shoulder height? Or, or it's that kind of indication I want to, to get at in terms of height changes. Carriageway around one and a half metres? I, yeah, I appreciate it. I, 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 I apologise. I didn't have time to get into the plans in that level of detail myself to figure this out. But uh, um, I do think it matters because a lot of this is about. The it's a significant intervention. Mm -hmm. I can start by saying that. As you start near Clarence um, by the Long Curtain Moat car park, it is insignificant. Very similar to the, what about the, the road drops away, yeah. and as you come to the car park and round, that height hopefully we'll have a cross section in a second, but it is, I believe, about a metre and a half yeah. um, in that. But as you say, the, the topography goes up and down, so talking about a metre and a half, and the road raises up to meet that and that is so that we don't have to have a large gate. So, so the area. earthwork is about a metre and a half? Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's worse place. Yes. And the other high area, I had concerns about the, 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 the long moat. At that highest point, though, it's maybe at most 80 centimetres different to current height, based on what I read in the report. Yeah, it, it's around there. It's only a, a thin skim on top of the current defence yeah. height there. And the other point um, which I was concerned about was the the war memorial, obviously being the one, the other one with significant impact, or potentially significant impact. Um, what's the, the height change there? It looked like um, maybe around a metre, one point, somewhere between a metre, a metre and a half, that it's going to be dropped down below the... Yeah, that's about, about right. It's about a metre that the, well, a metre and a half that it comes up from the existing road, but obviously the uh, war memorial or is, it, is already raised, so the difference between the war memorial and it is around a metre. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Pitt. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> the, we, we've heard quite a lot about uh, as usual on these occasions uh, around car use and cycling use um, but obviously the number one priority for the seafront is access by pedestrians um, are we clear that in terms of our aspirations both in the seafront master plan and in the Portsmouth plan and the MPPF so all the planning boxes that the priority on the seafront in this application is being given to pedestrians 
there is a line somewhere in the uh, report talking about the importance of the promenade um, as a um, um, pedestrian route. So, uh, uh, absolutely, yes. Right. Um, question f from the chair. First of all, sub frontage four uh, between the Sea Life Centre and the uh, the castle. Um, in that area, we have an area which is quite low ground and occasionally flooded even now. Is there any proposal to do anything to protect that area around the current bandstand? Um, the promenade and the rock armour um, is the defence for it, yes. But I mean, it, it, gr ground level isn't going to be changed for, for what is that sort of natural amphitheatre. Second question on sub frontage five coming eastwards. Um, it, the matter of the shingle has been raised. There's been a lot of shingle scour in that area. Um, over recent years. Um, are, is there going to be anything other than just the replenishment of the shingle to make the defence uh, outside the area which is now the pyramids? Right, so um, the primary defence is beach widening and um, the step remetment. So the, the, and, and the beach will be kept in place by the rock armour um, um, before it. I don't know whether the partnership, I want to embellish that in any way, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's the combination of the rock armour, the raising of the beach level. So the beach will, the new beach level will cover the rock armour which is there at the moment. Yes? No, no. Same. Sorry, Councillor Mason. Uh, in that area, the beach will be retained by a groin, which comes out just to the west of the pyramids, which you can just see as the yellow bit sticking out. So that will retain the beach in that area. So over the approximate 10-year recycle period, it will accumulate in that area, and that groin will stop it going offshore. Uh, there is also a significant increase in both volume and width of the beach all the way along there. So there will be a lot more shingle. Does that answer the question? That does indeed. My third question concerns businesses. Um, we've heard from Clarence Peer this morning, um, very, two very detailed comments, but there are also other operations along the seafront. Um, Mozzarella Joe's, the cafe, the cafe and restaurant, uh, you've got the South Sea Rowing Club, how are they going to be um, integrated into this system, into this scheme? I only ask because they will be significantly below, their current entrances will be significantly below the level of the promenade. Um, so both the Rowan Club and Mozzarella Joes will have steps and ramps incorporated between them and the new prom height. 
The scarab protection in Mozzarella Joes is to stop the loss of shingle in front of them, not to defend them from any flooding, but it's to stop the loss of shingle in that area. Uh, did you ask about a diff another business as well? Just those two. It might be helpful if you would uh, elucidate on other businesses along this area. So, uh, so, and we, we have been in discussion with um, Rowing Club as well. They've got aspirations themselves to work out how to incorporate them in, but it will be their own planning application that comes forward. Um, Mozzarella Joe's, uh, Mozzarella Joe's, as I just said, is where it is, and we have ramps, steps, making sure that they maintain access as they do at the moment. As we go around Blue Reef Aquarium, they are a moment behind the defence because there's no way of us taking the defence line in any other direction. Um, as we then move round past the castle, Pyramids is set far enough behind that it's not directly impacted. We then have the lifeguard hut and um, the Bryony. Both of those are set back from the defence and they have a clear uh, area in front of them between them and the defence to make sure that they're not impacted. We tie into the pier itself. The pier is a pier structure, therefore we can't, can't defend a pier structure. Um, South Sea Beach Cafe and the other area, other um, uses there are directly on the line of the defence and will need to be demolished and our plans include a footprint of a new development there uh, and then that is it. When we get up to St George's Road the scheme ties back in again and we don't impact the coffee cup. Councillor Smythe. I have a final uh, a question from, from my point of view about uh, swimming and beach access. Um, what I see here is that it looks like there'll be an extended area of safe swimming between the um, uh, Clarence Parade and Eastney. Um, but it, has anybody done any work as to how safe that will be? And, how, and I think it looks as if the access is going to be easier. But as a swimmer in the sea, for as long as I can in the season, can you reassure me that that's been taken into account and that there won't be a detriment to people who like to swim in the sea? There won't be a detriment. Their, their um, beach accessibility currently is poor, and this um, provides you know, enhancement in appropriate locations. I mean, it's still obviously got... It, it can't include a, a, um, 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 an opening that would, would result in a, in, a, in a breach, but designed in as part of the scheme, there is accessibility, which is um, a point that's covered... Um, under the um, any other matters raised in representations, beach accessibility for all on page 27. And I, will there be better access for people with disabilities? I'm very conscious I'm not getting any younger. Again, currently it's poor and, and some provision is being made as part of um, the proposals, yes. Thank you. Councillor Atkins, Councillor Hunt. Um, my final question concerns uh, comments as regard to highways. We've we kind of covered parking in the one direction road, so I don't want to go back over that, but um, the, the comment that the proposed um, new road layout in the area of the, the Serpentine Road allowed Carrant's Esplanade to do so it raises pedestrian road safety concerns given the high level of footfall attending the splash pool where two-way traffic meets the proposed one-way route. Uh, what is the junction proposal where two-way traffic meets one-way traffic? Will it turn round in the car park to the um, to the D-Day story, or, or, or in the car park in that area? Or, or what will happen? Or will the one is the problem that the the one the two-way lane just suddenly ends and turns into a one-way lane? How do we uh, turn traffic round when it meets the one-way area? Or need to ask again. Page 14 of the report I read. So, in that area, if you're travelling westbound, there's no change because you carry on going westbound. To go eastbound, the only way to be going eastbound is to be pulling out of the D-Day car park. So there's no need to do turn round on the D-Day side of it. Thank you. Mr. Hunt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Maguire, on pay at uh, the... Um, the Portsmouth Society uh, welcomed, or one of them did, I beg your pardon, welcomed the report from the, or well, the comments rather, the seafront manager on pages um, 14 and uh, 14 and 15, 
where the seafront manager raises some issues, one described by uh, um, just now, um, it's already certain that those comments that the seafront manager raises are covered by that condition 23, which everybody seems to be pointing out at the moment as a catch-all sort of situation, condition, <coughs> about the public being able to move around, shortcuts being made through these various um, uh, defences, and how people access various sites and so on. Will all those things still be up for discussion if we were to improve, approve this today? Because, you know, 23 isn't quite a catch-all, it catches quite a lot, but the, the comments from the seafront manager, let's face it, is hands-on and knows what um, he's talking about, if it's still the same person. And I just wondered, will we continue to talk and make sure that the views of the seafront sea manager are definitely um, taken very seriously? Yeah, as I say, there's a number of conditions that cross over the comments made by the seafront manager and perhaps more importantly by the local residents uh, groups around street furniture, materials, hard landscaping, soft landscaping, the uh, heritage assets. Uh, all of those matters are for uh, submissions, final construction and obviously any variations from that described in the uh, current application and any enhancements that can be included can all be built through those through part of, as has already been mentioned by Councillor Pitt, the ongoing uh, conversation that, that needs to occur in delivering this scheme. Yeah, and I, I've been listening very carefully and I'm very grateful for all the um, very uh, good questions which have dug some things out, but the, the one that uh, he talks about in particular is the scheme shows very frequent traffic mitigation bollards, that's quite a detail, throughout the length of the parallel parking areas to prevent access to the pro onto the promenade by vehicles, I presume. But there must be a more aesthetically viable option for what would be, by accident, become a, a defining feature along the whole of the seafront. Now, if I wasn't to raise that question today, people say, well, we didn't raise it. So I'm raising it, you know, and it seems to be something that well, might stick out like a sore thumb uh, and it's been pointed out by one of our officers already. Certainly, and like I say, bollards are specifically referenced uh, in the list of things that will be included in the street furniture and walls further submission. Thank you, Chair. In terms of the relocation of the uh, historic assets, so ma mainly monuments, um, are we sure that in the proposed relocation none of them are currently sited in a very specific location for a historical reason and that they are generally in that location? So in other words, is moving something going to change the context of what it is? because of the way in which horror travel had bigger vessels and needed um, to expand the um, pad eastwards, it, it frankly doesn't have a particularly um, brilliant relationship to horror travel. So there is an opportunity by this scheme um, for <coughs> um, some modest improvement there. And, and it's a similar scenario with the others. Um, you know, there might be an argument that Crumbing could have gone back where it is, but um, ultimately, um, I think if we um, 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 an order about it, it's on a sort of strange um, um, orientation, but it will help for that piece of public realm in the future to, to potentially um, host events, etc. So, um, with the Conservation Officer, we were satisfied that the alternative solutions um, are appropriate, as I say. Um, well there's, there's a wider, I was going to add, there's a wider discussion about whether um, Trafalgar might be more appropriate 
um, <coughs> in Old Portsmouth um, near Nelson, but, but that isn't something sought to be um, progressed through the submission. This is about trying to find a suitable alternative position proximate to where it currently is. Okay, and I'm assuming that there is an opportunity while we're moving them and putting them back somewhere <coughs> to um, look for some external funding around refurbishment and improvement, because I looked at the Trafalgar one on Sunday and it's, it's, it's in desperate need of some um, reconditioning. Oh, yes. Well, certainly there were a requirement for construction method statements around the works that are going to take place um, and where, if there are any materials within the, the existing plinth that can't be reused, um, um, you know, what the re re replacements will be necessary. On this whole matter, um, I would refer members to the Historic England letter to Mr Banting on the 18th of November, which uh, you will find on the website. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm not sure that um, your question was answered, Councillor Pitt. I, I mean, there are none of them that say this is the spot at which this happened however many years ago, and therefore they shouldn't be moved because the context is an essential part of the monument. Is that right? Certainly there was nothing in the um, relevant chapter in the environmental statement that has, has, oh. has drawn that out. So um, I, I don't believe that to be the case, no. I, I, I think I've been long and checked that, but occasionally a monument's put up because this is the place at which this happened. I think that's what you were trying to get at. Yes. Thank you. If I may assist members, because I think it is quite important just to bring it, and we've given you one presentation for this and all the other listed building applications, but if you look at uh, page 35, which is the specific listed building application for the removal and relocation of the Grade 2 listed monuments, uh, and as Councillor Mason has kindly already directed us to the Historic England uh, comments, they have no objection. They feel that the move may allow them to be better appreciated, but it is important to raise to members before you vote on such matters that it does know that when we do move monuments of this nature, they uh, do lose their listed status and the application will need to be made to relist them. So uh, it's a fairly academic uh, matter, but an important one for members to be aware of before you make decisions on listed structures. Members, we, uh, that I think concludes the questions. Would you like a short break now before we come to the general discussion? Uh, you power through. I, I would propose finishing this and then breaking for lunch. Okay. Right. In which case, members, we come to comments. Um, I had Councillor Jonas's hand was up first, and then Councillor Hunt. Chairman, if what I've heard is correct, um, and we agree to this um, plan today, um, there are still cases, especially regarding access to the seafront, which I'm very concerned with, that um, future administrations, or the present administration for that matter, can uh, authorise a complete change. We could move the roadway, we could move the cycleway, we could move the parking, regardless of what we actually decide today. That is my understanding. And if that's the case, and as long as it was prioritised as pedestrians, cyclists and motorists, then my um, comment is um, we should proceed because climate change is not going to wait for anybody. We need to protect our seafront. And at the moment, I've seen quite a few right from the beginning over the years. Uh, it might not be to everyone's satisfaction. We're never going to please everybody. And I would say to um, propose the officer's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. That's a proposal of the officer's recommendations. Uh, Councillor Hunt. I'm happy to uh, second that. Uh, I've listened very very carefully today and I hope that some of my questions are reflected that particularly around the cycling so, and I think that overall this is um, so much better than how it started out and all the evidence is that the coastal partnership <coughs> has engaged with and taken into account uh, residents concerns not everybody's going to be pleased with that I know that uh, but we also as uh, as um, we just heard uh, we have to get on with it and we have to make sure that Portsmouth is protected. We've also had assurances from the senior planning officers 
that many of the important matters that we've been talking about today are still up for grabs as it were and that the road for example uh, uh, can be utilised in uh, many different ways and I'm sure lots of representations will be made about that. I was particularly uh, wanted to hear about the uh, heritage sites and uh, I think that the, everything that Councillor Smythe has said is right too. Uh, I don't think the anchor is actually the anchor that uh, is the real anchor but nevertheless it is an opportunity isn't it to improve the setting of those um, some of them very looking tired looking uh, places. Uh, so um, I think I asked a lot of questions about the visitor economy which is so important to us and for jobs in the city and for businesses along the seafront and on balance I'm looking at this and I reckon it's going to improve the visitor economy there's going to be a lot of opportunities here for public open spaces for events along the seafront to be improved in line with the seafront um, master plan and uh, for a whole variety of reasons I think that uh, this is a great opportunity for our city and we should get on with it to make sure that we don't have flooding and that Celia's house doesn't go under four meters of water or anything like that I think she'd be hopping mad if it did <laughs> and, and I don't want that to happen at all um, and so I think yes I want to second this and I would like us to get on with it um, it's been a marvellous consultation and it's a credit to everybody and Mr Banting for being so clear today about what's what so I'm naughty grateful for everybody that's uh, from everywhere including all the public deputations for everything that they've done to get us to where we are today Councillor Stubbs um, yeah, firstly, just as a, a, just for noting, really, but when we get on to the actual votes on this, I think on the one relating to South Prairie Pier, just because I live very close to that part, I will abstain on that part. I won't vote on that. Um, I mean, I think that this is this is a very positive application. Um, it clearly needs to be done. I certainly support it. Um, you know, we've had quite a lengthy debate about this. I don't mean here, but I mean over the last couple of years, um, and. Some of the things which which initially came forward, um, not um, you know, in terms of really really addressing this party at Celia, um, is I, I thought um, were not entirely realistic when there was talk about you know massive under um, um, under the common car park and such like. I mean, these were just sort of crazy costs. We've got to keep this thing somewhere in budget. I mean, this is this is an expensive project. I mean, I'm concerned actually about the amount it's going to cost, but we're still going to have to do it. So we've got to come up with a realistic scheme. I think there's a lot of positives to what's in front of us. Um, it is um, a good job. There's a lot more which there's a lot more matters which are going to have to be considered further down the line on the details of this because a lot of this isn't going to be built for years yet anyway. So there's plenty of time. For for it all um, and I would certainly hope that we will be possible to secure some additional funds maybe from the LEP for some um, things not directly related to this but which improve the whole visitor experience and open up opportunities uh, perhaps for, for additional commerce along the seafront. Um, we've had a lengthy debate about the Clarence Pier issue, I mean I hear what um, has been said by the objectors there. Um, this site, uh, at least to my knowledge, is not an allocated site, at least not in the 2012 uh, local plan, although it may well have been pr promoted um, in the, its revision. Um, uh, it's the m most important thing is to have enough time to work out what's going to happen there. I don't know what the options realistically are. I mean, I don't particularly want to see a site cut off in this way, but I accept the argument that's been put forward by officers that in terms of where we are right now and what we know right now, it's all they can put forward. So I accept that, but I hope that's not what actually ends up being built there, and I hope we can come up, uh, the council can come up with a better solution to that over time. Councillor Norton, <coughs> Councillor Smythe, Councillor Udi, then Councillor Pitt. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think most of, of my concerns have been uh, covered here. I, initially, I, I think it's fair to say I, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the look of it uh, and what have you. But what I like less is um, more procrastinating and, uh, and not getting this done. So I think we do need to get this done. Uh, most options are, are likely to be uh, rejected um, um, by the public, but we need to act on this, I think, before it's too late. Um, you know, the one-way system, for instance, and, and the idea of the long-term beach management plan, which is moving the shingles every now and again, are, are not particularly appealing. But again, we, we really should act on this. Um, I think and correct me if I, I can't do this, I think what I'd like to 
propose is approval with some certain conditions and that is that the following conditions 17, 22, 23, 25, 26, 27 and 38 are brought back to the planning committee as and when required. Now most of those are about the soft landscaping, the public art, the feature walls etc but I think it's those aesthetics uh, and those kind of um, conservational bits which people, uh, the public will want uh, greater detail and say on, um, you know, the zigzag paving, for instance, at the moment, I know is something which seems quite insignificant, but it is a feature that you know, children and people recognise with the seafront. Um, and, and somewhere along the line, you know, 17, 22, 23, 25, 26, 27 and 38, they're all of the kind of um, aesthetic ones, soft landscaping, etc. Um, and they're things that I think probably require... Uh, once this decision has been made, hopefully, and it, it's put in place, that so we know that you know that the safety is, is going to be secured there. Uh, more that the aesthetics, you know, are, it's somewhere along the line, that the Tricon Centre was considered at one point a good idea and visually, you know, pleasing and what have you. And I think nowadays we really do need to consider, um, you know, things that are going to be in place for a long, long time and um, how they're going to look. So I, I would like to request that those conditions come back to planning, not to cabinet or various departments. Can I do that? You can certainly propose that. The, that um, I see no problem with that, do you? There's a proposition that the members would agree. So I'll have to defer to my, to my uh, legal democratic services. Obviously, it doesn't amend the conditions. The conditions are what, what they say. How we manage those are a, a bureaucratic issue, not a planning one, I'm afraid. Yeah. Whilst we're taking advice on the feasibility of that, um, I will take uh, Councillor Smythe. Um, my point was very slightly related to, to that point, and, and I don't think it's the uh, coming back to planning that I'm concerned about. I just wanted to say that I'm really reassured by the assurances given to us by the East South Sea Coastal Partnership and indeed by planning officers, that there will be further consultation on all the very many important details um, of this application. And um, on that basis of that reassurance that's now captured on uh, um, in, in every single um, minutes and also it will be captured on the live stream, um, I'm very reassured that we'll continue to have the proper public engagement on those details and I would like to uh, move that we went straight to approve this planning permission unamended because I'm not so worried about the planning committee seeing those details as the public having a say. Councillor Udi. Um, just to raise on Councillor Norton's point, if we brought this back to planning committee every time something happened, we'd mm. be having planning committees for lamp posts at different times because I would gather that the design portion of the whole of the seafront would be happening in different phases so therefore it would be hundreds of planning, not hundreds but <coughs> at least a fair few that we'd decide even though we've been assured and absolutely assured, oh, I mean we sent you on this that we're going to consult at every phase because I am not a fan of the design at the moment as it stands and I really think we should be trying to sack off cars at this point and hopefully a good consultation will bring up that point and I think we can rearrange some stuff but we need to get this in now because if we don't we're not going to get the funding and I've been told it's 10 years and as someone who's campaigned against climate change if I store this for 10 years and people lose their houses then that's me done in it. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Can I respond to that Chair? Uh, Council Norton, yeah, just uh, may I, before you do, uh, having taken advice on this, the conditions are what the conditions are, but we can add an informative statement <coughs> to the minutes of this meeting that the meeting would be, uh, would wish to be involved in the replanning as detailed in those particular conditions. Would that satisfy you? Yeah. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Right. So, Councillor Norton has merely suggested that it should be an informative uh, statement which is minuted. 
Now, who is next? <laughs> um, I think it was, um, yeah, cou Councillor. I've done. You've done. I'm going to second his uh, proposal, okay. but I'm sure we've had conditions brought back here before. Sorry. No, I'm sure we've had conditions yeah. brought back here before for the committee to oversee and discharge. I think that's within our power. Yeah. Mr. McGuire. Yeah, just to be absolutely clear, it's a, it's a planning decision, and consequently all planning decisions ultimately can be determined at any point in the Council. The full Council can determine it. This committee certainly is well within the rights to determine compliance conditions. Well, I'd uh, like to second Councillor Norton's proposal then. What I propose with those is we'll put an informative on the decision notice, because mm. as, as has been noted, these are discharged in phases, so it may well be that the details we're looking at is half a decade away uh, for the final phase of a final feature wall, and none of us will maybe be here at that time. So an I intend to be notice. here. <laughs> <laughs> I fear you will be. <laughs> I think it's Councillor Atkins then Councillor Pitt. <laughs> Technically the other way around. Oh, well, okay. okay uh, yes, one comment, uh, Chair, is just related to exactly what uh, Ian's just said, is that my concern is that we will have ongoing pub public consultation about different bits of this, but it could then be a considerable gap between the public having their view, which they might be very clear about, and sometime later, something coming back to the planning committee with a whole different bunch of councillors sat here who weren't part of that. And I think this needs to be an organic process that is led by the public, not something where on the base, and we've seen this played out today, because I know from the part of the cross-party discussions that we've had, for example, that the reason we have the current situation with the one-way road and the parking is that in those consultations that we did with the public, that's what the public said they wanted. Now, it may be that the public's view changes over time, but I'm not in the business of, ride, of what is the point in having public consultations and then riding roughshod over them because we arbitrarily sit here, listen to a presentation and say we disagree. This committee has authority and control, so, so it should, but my primary focus in all of this, and I, it, I think it should be all of our focus, is what do the public want for their sea defences? That's what the deputies were asking us earlier on, was to focus on consultation, listening to them, and coming to a view based on those consultations. The power should not rest with this committee on this, the power should rest with the public. Councillor Atkins. Uh, yeah, so in, in my comments, I, I wanted to reiterate some of the points um, that, that I think have already been made. Um, I think uh, this design is a significant improvement on something like a, a bare concrete wall. I like the fact that it's reliant on the beach. It is a problem that we'll have to keep uh, replenishing the beach, but I think overall the, the, the slopes up and the slopes down are better than some sharp angular seawall uh, along the length of our seafront, and I think that will retain and maximise the, the ability of, of the public and tourists to continue to enjoy the, the South Sea Seafront. So I do think this is a better design. I think there are aspects of it I don't like, but I think you would find that there will be aspects that, that people didn't like across the board. Nobody is going to like everything in this scheme. It is too large and too complex. Um, I do have concerns about that particular um, area where there is a, a single lane of traffic and, and the cycling. I particularly, I, I'm not the uh, hugely enthusiastic cyclists, but I have different times in my life use my bike, and one of the things, the factors that does tend to influence it is whether or not I can have a continuous cycle lane, um, and, and the fact that you have to cross from one side of the carriageway to the other is, is certainly not ideal. Um, but you see, my perspective on it would be that I don't think we can sacrifice too much parking space without detriment to local residents, without detriment to tourism in the area, without visitors feeling they can't come because they can't park. Um, so from my point of view, I would almost be more tempted to sacrifice a small element of the, um, the footpath, but that's probably highly controversial and disagreed with. So it, it just goes to show I think there are different perspectives on these things. Um, I fully agree that... Um, that the public should take the lead on this. Um, I will support Councillor Norton's uh, proposal because the authority is going to either rest with the cabinet or with the committee, and I think the committee actually potentially with its deputations, um, and as a final point of oversight, I'm not suggesting the committee get involved in the minutiae of all the decisions, but that 
a final point of oversight that if you like the committee can um, ensure that the, the consultations have taken place and the public have had their say I think is actually potentially more effective than if the decisions are made primarily by officers and by um, the cabinet but um, uh, so I would support Councillor Norton's proposal on that basis uh, however I think overall the scheme um, has to be put through I think that to, for me the, the most difficult aspect of it is, of it is actually the effect on the, the war memorial. I think it's a shame that that ends up at a, a point of law promise, prominence, but I think overall that is a, a, a cost that has to be borne, um, which is justified by um, the, the many benefits that the scheme provides. So um, uh, I would be happy to support the report with, with Councillor Norton's proposed um, uh, amendment or, or um, comment on the uh, decision. Uh, Councillor Pitt, then I intend to move to uh, the votes. Chair, in the interest of come, trying to come to a, uh, something that, that ticks both boxes on this, um, and I, you know, I note <laughs> colleagues' comments, and it's it's all about the, how these things play out in terms of the real life rather than an aspiration. Could we? add to Councillor Norton's motion, um, because it, uh, certain, some colleagues are moving in that direction, that uh, such um, future consultation with this committee is supported by a report uh, into the public consultation that has taken place about those elements. Because we've lacked that today, we've had difficulty teasing True. that out, yeah. and you know, Alan said that's not the application that's in front of you. But we all, you know, people who haven't been part of that cross-party discussion, um, such as Councillor Atkins and Councillor Norton, who haven't been in those meetings, um, need to know what the public think as well. So, if it is coming back here and that is the decision, <coughs> would members accept that there should be a, uh, an attached report saying what consultations happened on those elements with the public and what they're response was. Okay, well, I think we now need to take these things in order. First of all, Councillor Norton has proposed that uh, an informative note be added to the minutes. That is, is it the opinion of this committee that the planning aspects of matters referred to in conditions 17, 22, 23, 25, 26, 27 and 38 should be brought back to this committee and should be supported by a report on the public consultation on those matters. Councillor Norton has uh, proposed it, it has been seconded. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. That is carried. We now move to the substantive matters uh, which we have to take a decision on today. I have assumed that the proposal and by Councillor Jonas and the seconding by Councillor Hunt refers to all of the six items on which we need to take a vote. Is that correct, Councillor Jonas? That's correct. Councillor Hunt, is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we move to item number one. South Sea Seafront from Long Curtain Moat in the west to Eastern Marine Barracks in the east. Uh, the overall scheme. Those in favour, please show. That is unanimous. Item two, the concerning the seafront shelters, number seven, eight, and eleven on Clarence Esplanade. Those in favour, please show. Those. Uh, that is unanimous. Item three, the monuments in the various locations on Clarence Esplanade and South Sea. Those in favour of the report, please show. Thank you. That again is unanimous. <laughs> Item number four, the South Parade Pier on South Parade South Sea. Those in favour of the scheme, please show. Those against, please show. Those abstaining, please show. Councillor Stubbs' abstention should be noted. 
The lamp columns in various locations on Clarence Esplanade, South Parade and Eastney Esplanade, their removal and reinstatement, those replacement, <coughs> those in favour please show, those against please show, no there wasn't anybody so it's unanimous. Okay, and the lastly, the treatment of the Royal Naval War Memorial on Clarence Esplanade, South Sea, those in favour please show. That again is unanimous. So for those six items they have got planning permission. I propose now a three-quarter hour break. We will then come back at... Sorry? Half an hour. Okay. We will come back at one o'clock.
<laughs> Members would, of course, note that the two councillors who were most adamant that we only needed half an hour are not back. <laughs> but there we are. Uh, find them, yes. <laughs> Possibly shame them. One thing which I failed to do this morning, which uh, since we are actually core, right, we may as well do, is to agree the meeting dates for the remainder of the municipal year. 8th of January, 19th of February, 11th of March and 15th of April. Are they agreeable to members? Agreed. Thank you. Brighton Dairy. Yeah. Yeah. It's going on that yeah. Really well, I think it was probably ninety, something like ninety-three that they ceased to be. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Councillor Atkins, another minute. Oh, right. oh, Councillor Atkins has arrived. Yes. <laughs> Members, we come now to item seven, which you find on page fifty-three: the former Drayton Dairy in Station Road, Portsmouth. I have uh, one deputation here from Mr. Jeremy Gardner. Would he please come to the table? Before we take the deputation, I will have the officer's report on this matter, please. Thank you. Uh, it sounds like most members are quite familiar with this site. Sorry, I need some pictures. <laughs> I think a lot of people are quite familiar with this site in Drayton, um, which was the former dairy, uh, which has ceased operation a number of years ago. There's also now no buildings left on the site, so it is a, it is a cleared site. Um, we've got the railway line to the south. Um, there's some industrial estates nearby, but otherwise the surrounding area is mostly residential and fairly low density sort of family home area. Uh, directly to the north of the site is a, a little area of open space. I'm not sure whether it's got a formal name. I think informally with this application we call it the Caron Avenue open space. Um, it's got access from Caron Avenue and Station Road. Um, and the access to the site at the moment is roughly where that circle is there, so opposite some houses on Station Road. I just included a, a, an image of when it was the dairy, <laughs> just to show um, the buildings that used to be on the site before it was cleared. This picture was taken just about a couple of weeks ago, which just shows that it's a cleared site now with a number of material piles, but that, that's related to the remediation of materials following demolition, which is all ongoing on the site at the moment. So the application is uh, for reserve matters following the grant of outline planning permission in 2018. I think it came to committee in 2017, granted permission in 2018, for up to 108 dwellings, and the reserve matters seeks um, 108 dwellings on the site. Um, 
the matters that will be for determination, it is, that are for determination in this scheme, relate to the appearance, land, layout, landscaping and scale. And I'm just going to go through each of those matters as I've done in the report um, with some images for you to look at. Just to show you where the access is, the access proposals are the same as for the outline. So the current access is, as I said, opposite some houses on Station Road. The proposal is to relocate the access further south down Station Road, opposite the entrance to what I think is a sewage works, uh, roughly around here. Um, and that is as per the outline permission, so there's no changes there. In terms of layout, um, it's a fairly traditional sort of perimeter block style layout, so houses are fronting either roads or public open space. Um, we've got a row of detached properties along here with, with a tree line frontage which was, which was designed to um, respect the character that we've got on the opposite side of Station Road. We've got an area of open space on the southern side of the site, and I will talk more about that in, in a bit, um, with some flats. There's one block of flats which is three storey high. Um, and, uh, and then a mix of terrace detached, semi-detached houses and one bungalow up here in the northwest, uh, northwest corner. Um, and part of the reason for that being a bungalow was to respect the relationship with some bungalows in Wainwright close to the <coughs> west. So in terms of the open space, um, it is a small area of open space for the number of dwellings on that site. So we have a policy requirement that talks about um, a, a, a size of open space per population and if you were to go with that I think you'd need about 0.7 hectares and this is 0.1 so it is a, it's a vast shortfall on what the policy would require so um, so what the applicants have suggested is to secure improvements to the open space to the north of the site which is council owned that's been liaised with and agreed with the council's parks officer uh, and would be secured through a deed of variation to the 106 for a sum of money to be used for improving the Cowan Avenue open space, which would include creation of better trails, um, signage, street, some benches, um, vegetation clearance, and new planting. So that's, um, and this section 106 is in progress at the moment. That would be secured. Um, and that is seen to compensate for the shortfall on site. And then it's also notable that Drayton Park is relatively close, which offers a lot more recreation facilities. But this would include a local area play for small children, which is what was required through the outline as well, which would be here in kind of natural natural play features and earth bounds, mounds. <coughs> so this is just some just an example showing how the there will be two entrances to the open space to on the north of the site. Um, the way it's been designed is to just be a sort of open kind of soft entrance. Uh, it's not proposed to be gated, but the applicants are proposing a, a, a bollard or similar to prevent kind of, you know, sort of youngsters, mopeds and things spe speeding through. Uh, at the request of our parks team, it won't be lit, so it's to discourage entrance at night, but it, it would remain open. Right, so just moving on to the parking layout. Um, the scheme includes a total of 192 parking spaces, 17 of which will be visitor spaces. I did note in the supplementary matters that it said seven visitor spaces on one of the pages of the report in error. It was just a, a missing one. <laughs> so it's 17 visitor spaces, four disabled spaces. This complies with the council's parking standards. And um, the way it's been designed is to try and get as much parking as possible down the sides of properties. Um, it's not, you know, there, there is a need for some small parking courts um, and some sort of curbside visitor bays. Uh, but, but in general, it's been designed to try and break up the parking and uh, so there would be planting, which I'll show you on the landscape strategy. Uh, it's also been designed, the, the road layout's been designed to make sure that large vehicles can turn safely within the site and these tracking plans have been viewed and agreed with our highways engineer to show that fire vehicles and refuse vehicles can manoeuvre correctly through the site. So moving on to the matter of appearance, um, this includes details of uh, materials um, as well on the houses. So there's a, a variety of house types, semi-detached, detached, detached um, t small terraces. 
it's a fairly traditional design with pitched roofs, um, fairly traditional main material of red brick and some buff brick, which I'll show you on another image. Um, the height of the buildings is predominantly two-storey, but there would be some three-storey buildings dotted around the site, including, some, including the flats here. Um, the surrounding area is mostly two-storey and single-storey with some bungalows, so the, so the, the sort of general two-storey uh, scale is considered to be acceptable. Um, materials, there would be some sort of more modern features, sort of cladding and, and aluminium frames, windows, and it's felt that this is appropriate to add interest to the scheme. So this is just a couple more images. This, this would be the, one of the elevations of the flats and the bungalows. So everything's sort of designed to tie in to each other. Um, one particular house design was these corner plots, which is house type, referred to as house type C, uh, has this kind of different feature, interesting feature. Um, this, this image also shows you how some of the houses would be constructed in the buff colored brick to vary the tone slightly through the scheme. And that's shown again on the street scenes. So you have a mix of materials, but they're all sort of keeping a sort of standard design throughout. Um, <coughs> that's right, landscape proposals. <coughs> this has been um, this has been agreed in liaison with our council's landscape architects. Um, we negotiated certain planting species in 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 parts of the site. <coughs> <coughs> so as I said, there's the pocket park down here, um, the tree light in frontage here, and there's a couple of bits of landscaping I'll just draw your attention to, which is covered in the report. There were some queries from residents of Station Road up here about the trees along this boundary. Um, they would be hazel trees, uh, which are sort of medium compact trees, and the numbers of them have been reduced to prevent significant over overshadowing here. I would note there's also a fairly extensive vegetative boundary along there anyway, um, but we did, they have sought to address that concern. Uh, on this corner here, there was some concern from neighbours about the possible impact of large roots for what was going to be an oak tree. Um, this is now being proposed to be a hornbeam tree and the applicants have suggested putting a, a root protection in to protect the boundary walls in that location. Uh, in terms of maintenance of landscaping, the majority of the landscaping would be, would be maintained by a management company the, uh, and the details of that would be secured through the original 106 um, other than private rear gardens which would be in private ownership. This is just showing you the, the, the trees along the front which I think I've referred to a couple of times. I've just done a couple of images because we did have some some concerns raised by some of the neighbours, um, in particular some properties here on Station Road which is number 188186 have raised concern about the position of these properties here, these plots, um, which are two storey buildings. These are located to the north of these properties at an angle, um, so in, in, in the officer's assessment of the impact given the northern orientation um, the fact they're not directly behind so the windows wouldn't directly overlook it's not felt that, that those buildings would result in any, a significant impact in terms of overshadowing or loss of light to these properties so that relationship is considered to be acceptable um, and then I included the view from Wainwright close just to show you the sort of low rise buildings in that location and there would be a bungalow as one of the closest buildings there and the larger buildings behind these garages And this again shows you some pictures I took from the property of number 186 Station Road looking to the, no uh, looking to the north. Um, these trees are within the garden of 186, so wouldn't be affected. Um, and that would be the view towards the two-storey properties over here. i just um, touch on some other matters that are covered in the report. Um, Flood risk was addressed at the outline stage and uh, it required them to, by condition to prepare a detailed drainage strategy which is currently under review and has been agreed in principle by our drainage engineers um, subject to a few further details. Because the site was previously laid to hard standing mostly, uh, this scheme is should, should create a betterment in terms of surface rate runoff and the scheme would include um, sort of storage tanks and things to make so that the surface water doesn't run off the site so much. Um, 
in terms of refuse storage, uh, each house would have its individual refuse stores and the flats would have a community refuse store and the applicants have noted and taken account of the requirements of our refuse officer in that. Uh, ecology, similar to flood risk, because the site had very limited ecology potential before, it's now got um, a greater potential to enhance biodiversity and one of the condition requirements, again from the outline, was for a mitigation and enhancement scheme which has been agreed by our county ecologists um, which would include things like bat boxes, bird boxes within buildings, native planting species that attract wildlife. Um, so it is felt that this scheme would create a net gain in biodiversity as per our policy requirements. And um, I'll touch on the impact on the special protection areas. In terms of recreational impact, the Section 106 to the Outline Scheme includes a contribution towards the Solent Recreation Mitigation Strategy. Um, and in terms of nitrates, I think I'm going to leave that one to uh, update from Ian Maguire. The report sets out the current position, but I think Ian has a bit more of an update. So uh, in conclusion, the details that have been submitted for the reserve matters are considered to be acceptable, and the scheme is recommended for <coughs> approval. Thank you. Mr. Maguire. As I mentioned at the opening of uh, our previous session, we have now uh, endorsed our interim nitrates mitigation strategy. So this is the first decision to be issued in accordance with that strategy. Uh, page 66 and 67 of the agenda explains the good work that the case officer has done uh, to align this scheme with that strategy. In short, we require developers to see how they can solve the problem for themselves. Uh, a couple of bullet points you can see halfway down page 67 are the matters that the developer uh, examined to see if they couldn't achieve nitrate neutrality within the site or within uh, the development parameters. Uh, they were unable to do that and consequently they proposed to utilise our nitrate bank, i.e. the overage of wastewater uh, savings that we are creating through making interventions in Portsmouth City Council housing stock, which we can then sell to developers to uh, reduce the overall amount of nitrate coming into uh, the protected waters to achieve a matter of neutrality. That strategy has in principle been endorsed by Natural England, but as always the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. The formal appropriate assessment of that will be uh, reviewed by Natural England in accordance with the habitats regulations uh, and any concerns that they come back with on an individual basis will obviously inform the final decision. The securing of those credits uh, is a matter of the Section 106 agreement, uh, a deed of variation in this case, uh, and the amount they will pay for them is a matter of viability, a matter of ongoing negotiation. Uh, but all of those things uh, are delegated to officers in accordance with the recommendation within here if you're happy to do so, and we'll be confident we can move those uh, matters forward rapidly to get the decision issued if all other planning considerations are acceptable to you at this time. Thank you. Mr. Gardner, you have six minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, members. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gardner, agent for the applicant Dandara. Uh, the applicants are very pleased and, and not a little relieved, it has to be said, that this Reserve Matters application is before you for determination today. Um, Dandara acquired this brownfield site from its previous owners. Um, it's a former industrial site, as you've heard, and they acquired it with the benefit of outline planning permission for up to 100 and eight homes in 2018. Uh, since then, in fact since autumn 2018, we've conducted a genuine, thorough process of community engagement, pre-application consultation and a planning application process that began in April. We submitted draft schemes in October and December 2018 uh, to your authority, um, which uh, Alan Banting commented on at that time. His comments related to the location and the usability of the pocket park we'd shown at that time. Uh, the potential opportunity to improve the adjoining Caron Avenue public open space. The design of the entrance street from Station Road. The potential impact on amenities of neighbouring residents due to the position and site of, siting of some houses shown on the draft scheme at that time. Um, and the avoidance of front gardens being used for, the, for parking in the future. Um, so we revised the draft scheme to address those issues and then held a public consultation event in March uh, which 41 local residents attended. Uh, 20 of those completed comment forms to give us feedback and of those 20, 14 supported the proposals, 3 objected and 3 were neutral. Uh, Dandara also 
uh, took time to visit certain individual neighbours. Um, for example, in Wainwright Close, as you've heard, um, the cul-de-sac of bungalows to the site's western boundary to discuss individual concerns of certain residents. And further changes to the scheme followed, including repositioning of houses further away from the boundary, the hipping of certain roofs to reduce the visual impact of certain houses, and the introduction of the bungalow you've heard about um, in the western corner of the scheme nearest to Wainwright Close. Uh, leading to one neighbour, uh, Mr South in number four, who'd previously been objecting to the draft proposals to uh, have written in support of the planning application. It's also gratifying that Mr Lattimore of 135 Station Road also took time to write in support, stating that the developers have taken care to listen to residents' views and noting that the site's entrance remains in the position wanted by residents that the much desired play area has been provided and the removal of the ugly high boundary wall around the southern edge of the site will create visibility around the bend in Station Road at the bottom of the screen you see there, um, which was a, another positive benefit of the scheme. Uh, you'll also note from the officer's report that this application has only received two, two objections, um, but they seem to relate to issues of principle, um, such as traffic, which have already been addressed at outline permission stage. All of this is evidence of the lengths that the applicant has gone to in responding to points raised by the local community in reaching the final scheme. So the scheme before you of 108 homes includes 30% affordable housing, 32 affordable homes, 72 dwellings of three beds or more, so 67% of the scheme is family housing against a policy requirement of at least 40% and a development density of 44 dwellings per hectare against a minimum requirement of 40. So the scheme meets all policy requirements. As you've heard, we're also proposing a variation of the outline section 106 agreement so that a, an additional financial contribution can be paid to deliver improvements to the Caron Avenue public open space which immediately abuts the site to the north. Uh, th there's a close interrelationship obviously between the scheme and that open space and in the proposals housing is positioned to overlook that space making it more secure, inviting and usable for everyone, existing and new residents alike, whereas at the moment it's a, a pocket of open space tucked around the back of houses, um, which brings with it the sort of attendant um, risks. So Dandara has worked closely with your officers for over a year now, um, firstly with Alan Banting, most recently with the case officer Rebecca Altman and her colleagues, whose efforts have been appreciated. We've listened and responded to neighbours in arriving at the scheme before you today, which we very much hope you'll support to bring this vacant brownfield former industrial site back into use to deliver much needed housing and local environmental improvements with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, questions? Uh, <laughs> yeah, OK. And where is the Could you please show where the... Um, yeah, the... Is, it's mixed around the site, yeah, the flats... Is that working? The flats would be um, affordable. Um, and then the properties shown in pink and blues uh, are affordable units. So they are in various parts of the site. Yeah. Right. Councillor Pitt. Um, yeah, because of the... Um, the groundwater runoff issues in this area um, obviously the schemes being presented with everyone having a, a small back garden which is great um, but we all know that down the road people start taking up turf and sticking down hard surfaces um, and would you know that could have an impact on that groundwater runoff down the road is there anything I have a quick look I couldn't see anything in the conditions that stop that happening at some future point uh, because actually the scheme as presented I really like um, but I am concerned that the scheme with all of those back gardens gone and hard standings there in, the, in their place um, would potentially provide a very different environment and um, we are all about green. Uh, there is a condition on there that removes permitted development rights. Um, I, Which one is it? It's number three. There's, there's not many conditions because this is a reserve matters. Yeah. Um, problem is, off the top of my head, it, we, we've restricted part two of schedule two. I'd need to check if that was um, hard surfacing. Hard surfacing. Yeah. But 
we could what I was trying to say what I'm getting at is we could we could add it into that condition if that was a concern but what I will also say is that um, most of the areas of landscaping in front of the houses would be managed by the management company and not the individual householders and that's part of the proposal from Dandara Chair, with indulgence, just to follow up, because it's, it's, it's what I'm really getting at here, is we've, we've got a view from our uh, officers that the scheme as presented will assist, not be a detriment to the way wastewater is dealt with in the area, but have we got an understanding of what their view is if all those back gardens were ended up being um, tarmacked over, for example. So, you know, it is it is a concern going forward as to what impact that may have. So if they were turning into patios, does that reverse or change the current view? Because if we don't do something about it at this stage, that could happen. Mm -hmm. And in all likelihood would happen into at least a big chunk of them. I'm, I'm not a drainage expert, but um, the drainage, I have actually got an image, so I don't know if it's gonna help at all. Um, I've got a drainage, there's a drainage strategy that's been submitted and it's based on um, <clears throat> underground storage tanks for surface water runoff um, and as well as new foul and surface sewers. So my understanding is that would have been designed to take surface water runoff and have, and have enough capacity to store it, to stop it from running onto other sites. Um, I, I couldn't answer whether it takes into account of hard surfacing, Ian might. Yeah. Can you help Ian? So, as with all surface water drainage, it's a combination of infiltration on green spaces itself, which may include rain gardens, so flower beds, etc., uh, and taking advantage of either attenuation storage and release into uh, the existing surface water management system, often a combined foul and surface water sewer system, which this drawing seeks to achieve. Condition 3, as has been mentioned, has removed uh, Class F of uh, part 1 of Schedule 2, which is the right to undertake the provision within the courtesy of a dwelling house of hard standings. So they can't lay a patio without permission from us, and clearly in determining those future applications for patios, we look to ensure that they are installing rain gardens or similar to maintain that infiltration rate. Perfect, thank you. Councillor Atkins. <coughs> Yeah, so with, with regards to the uh, the small play park area that's being included on the uh, the scheme, M mention was made of, of wooden and sort of um, landscaped play equipment. Um, does that mean that th there won't be any installation of, of conventional play park equipment on the site then? That's right, yeah, that, that's it's proposed to be natural form features, not, not your standard um, metal swings. Okay. Is, is that something that's considered appropriate in this scheme or better even than the traditional I, th I think it's um i think it's considered to be it, it can be better it's more attractive certainly i think visually sometimes but um and and um i think our landscape architects felt it was a good layout for the play space councillor pitt in terms of the um emergency vehicle access can we go to that map Mission, thanks. Um, where we've got the, the bits for reversing and turning around, which I'm assuming are the blue bits, is that right? So the blue bits are where they're reversing, the red bits where they're going forward. Yeah, so in terms of those blue bits, for example, in Brompton Road, in my ward, um, we have that at the end of it because it's a dead end and people always park there. So, um, w whether they're supposed to or not. And on an estate like this, which is slightly set off the main drag, uh, and where you're not necessarily going to have the same levels of traffic enforcement because it's, it meets our parking standards and therefore unlikely to attract enforcement officers generally just wandering around it, um, what reassurances or what mitigation is being put in place to ensure that those reverse and turn points remain clear at all times? Are we intending to just do that with some double yellow lines, or is there something to actually prevent it happening? happening because the last thing you want is an emergency vehicle getting stuck and while it's been designed in the practicality of how these things operate can be very different. Peter? You? Um, it might be worth putting the other plan up um, and we can look at each of them in turn. The coloured one, big coloured one you had. Um, so at the top end, of, uh, the top right hand corner of the site there, the turning area happens in carriageway and we've got parking courts beyond either end, so you can't practically park in the road because you need to drive through it. Um, in the bottom left hand corner, 
the turning area again happens in front of parking bays there and immediately just above that in there there's the, the two turning areas in there um, so again they, they happen in front of parking spaces and if you parked in the turning area you'd be obstructing the parking space um, the one to the left hand side that one there that has parking spaces off either end of the turning area so if you parked in the turning area you'd be obstructing people's drives and they wouldn't be able to drive in and out um, so I'm not envisaging a need for yellow line restrictions or any particular odd built form I think the, the layout of the drives works to protect turning areas Excellent, thank you If there are no more questions, comments members please Councillor Stubbs. And just to say it's a very positive looking scheme and I move the report. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Smythe is seconding. Very good scheme. You wish to speak? I just, yeah, just so, speak. Okay. Uh, Councillor Norton. Yeah, no, I will speak on it because it's in my ward. Um, yeah, I think it seems like a very reasonable uh, and sensible scheme. Um, I've spoken to residents along uh, Station Road and, and most are, are very uh, much in favour of this. They want to get it done um, because uh, of, of the time that it's been spent uh, at Derelict. Um, I think there are some concerns about um, you know, the, the stress that this will put on to you know, schools, doctor surgeries, etc. But that's not a consider. Uh, planning um, consideration and the same with the, the, the speeding down um, Station Road but again that's something I think that we can look at as councillors. All in all a very uh, good scheme I think and I, I'm very pleased that the removal of the wall means that going around the corner there is 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 going to be easier and uh, safer so yeah very very good. Okay it has been posed and seconded that the officer's recommendation be approved those in favour, please share. That is unanimous. You have your planning permission, sir. Before we start, members will or may have read a uh, letter sent to us this morning from the Keep Milton Green group uh, concerning this, this application. Um, if not, I, if anybody would wish to read that, I do have a copy here in hard copy. Sorry? You were, we were all emailed it this morning. You haven't seen it. Right. Right. May I have the officer's report, please? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, before we get into the report, uh, just to confirm to members a couple of uh, Further objection letters not picked up in the officer report in front of you, um, set out in the supplementary matters report for you, um, addressing, uh, repeating some of the comments that already set out in the published report, or some of them are somewhat more strategic city-wide comments, somewhat outside the scope of this application. But nevertheless, for the record, the extra two letters uh, had concerns about uh, congestion and overcrowded population in Portsmouth. We shouldn't be building more houses. We should, we should be building more shops and the infrastructure instead. Some comments about public transport, uh, parking permits and cycle paths, their adequacy in general, and a concern about travel time or congestion on that road. I think those comments are widely, um, broadly uh, picked up already in the report. This is the uh, site of the former Mr Pickwick public house on Milton Road, um, halfway between Milton Common to the south and the junction with Eastern Road 
and uh, Milton Cemetery to the north. Um, you can see the site in the centre of the picture. It's the two-storey building there, the uh, single-storey buildings around it, and the park, car park associated with the site. So just to take you through the context before moving on to the um, details of the proposals, uh, which are um, 12 flats in a single building of three storeys uh, with a fourth storey recessed uh, with flat roof. Um, but turning back to the site, um, the pub is a um, formerly attractive building uh, here with quite some interesting architectural features, the pediment, <coughs> detailing, brickwork and so on. Um, but as you can see, unfortunately, considerably knocked about over the years with uh, some unfortunate uh, alterations and extensions all around its uh, single story. Um, so uh, while there is some remaining or, or hidden um, architectural value, uh, nevertheless, we didn't feel it was something that we could resist its loss in principle. It is a shame to lose some fabric, uh, Victorian fabric, uh, in the city, but um, we didn't feel we could insist upon its uh, retention. <coughs> Otherwise, the site has been hoarded up for the last two years since the, the pub last operated. Um, so behind the hoarding, you've got the former car park and the uh, accretions around the site, uh, two-storey, three-storey main building. Um, on the opposite side of Eastern Road, uh, typical Portsmouth turn of the century housing, two-storey. Um, Holmes Park, a flatted development more modern uh, to the immediate north. Eastern Road itself, of course, everyone knows that it's a busy, busy main road in and out of the city. I'm, I'm sorry, of course, it's Milton Road, <laughs> leading to uh, Eastern Road. Thank you. Thank you, of course. Um, on the south side, we have a petrol station here, and it's a car wash. And then the most effective residents uh, are, are on the western side here, which is Maylands Avenue, uh, mid-20th century housing, two-storey. Nearly all of them have, as you can see here, single-storey rear extensions, and most of them have um, quite substantial uh, outhouses or, or you know uh, outbuildings uh, for various purposes uh, domestically. So there's the site itself. You can just see uh, Mayfield Avenue houses at the rear there. That's looking straight across at the site and the back of the houses there, Fratton Park beyond, and just on the west you can see the uh, northern boundary of the petrol station. This is in the Mayfield uh, Road houses, so the site is behind the photograph. Uh, I've got my back onto the site there, um, and here's one of the outhouses on the right-hand side, and here are the typical single-storey extensions to the houses. This is looking back at the site, so I've got my back to one of those uh, rear single-storeys uh, extensions. There's an outbuilding, there's the rear boundary wall, and there's, there's the former pub sitting there. The pub has uh, got typically tall, uh, high floor to ceiling heights, so although it's two storey to eaves, um, the eaves run through uh, with the same height as the three storey more modern development. So the new development of three storeys will be approximately to, to the eaves height, the same height as this one, albeit with the fourth storey on top, which you'll see shortly. This is upstairs uh, in Maylands Avenue. Um, showing again the views from bedrooms, uh, the existing pub, and then looking across the car park to the eastern side of Milton Road, and there's the petrol station. So you can see um, the sorts of buildings that most of the uh, houses have. This view, um, the, the, the new building will be sat uh, an approximately uh, from this point south. Um, so depending which house you're, you're looking from, um, this house would lose some of the existing building fabric and have it replaced instead here. Um, and the houses further south would look across, um, at the moment they have more openness beyond their walls or outbuildings, and that would be, that openness would accommodate the new three stroke four storey building. And that is a key issue in the application. There's another view, again, showing the site and there's the petrol station. Uh, that's just within the site itself, showing the hard standing and the petrol station. Sorry, this one's a little bit blurry, but here you can see the footprint imposed of the building. So the existing building sits overlapping here, uh, and this is the three-storey outline with a four-storey 
uh, sighted away from its edges in a recessed manner. So there again, that is the footprint of the existing two, three-storey building sat there with its accretions around the edges and those extensions you may have noticed earlier. This is the footprint of the new building. That is an overcroft, so the three-storey element would sit on that footprint there and around as you can see it. Um, parking spaces here, 13 spaces for 12 flats, accessed off this point here, uh, widened to accord with transportation uh, requests. As you can see, the main front door, communal front door here, with individual accesses um, off that point. And then some shared garden space around the site. Um, so good opportunities for some grass and shrubs uh, and planting of various sorts. Internally, there we are with the uh, refuse store, bike store, and the um, undercroft parking, and then flats on uh, each floor. Um, five, uh, sorry, six one-bedroom flats, five mm -hmm. two-bedrooms, and one three-bedroom flat on the roof. That's the main elevation facing Milton Road. So there's the two-storey element. Um, it does appear somewhat higher than uh, next door at Holmes Park. I'm not sure that's quite accurately drawn. Um, and there is the recessed fourth story. Architecture buff bricks are indicated uh, with some modelling uh, projections, um, architectural modelling around, around the fenestration and projections and recesses. And helpfully, we've got some shadows to accentuate and illustrate how it would feel um, as built in terms of sunlight giving the depth to the building uh, where that is caused by the projections and recesses. Members may have picked up from the uh, report that one amendment has been made during the course of the application, which was the removal of balconies at the rear, which was sit situated here and here. Um, independently of, of what neighbours thought, I thought that was uh, too close and too intensive in terms of overlooking with people coming out onto a balcony, being able to lean over and be quite close to neighbours' windows and gardens. Um, neighbours felt the same and the applicant was happy to remove those balconies, A, and B, um, originally they were full height windows, this is a matter of perception. Um, we've now got the panes uh, opaquely glazed or, or, or covered effectively um, at lower level just to reduce the perception of, of overlooking from um, those windows. You'd still be able to see out obviously above waist height, but there's a perception there. So if I take you back to the site. Um, Probably the key issue, uh, along with uh, scale and design, is the relationship with the neighbours to the rear. Um, it is a, a, a limited site um, in terms of getting uh, a new development like this. We've had pre-application discussions which included where should a building be sited on, this, on, on, the, on the, the land. Um, at one point it was at the northern end, but that meant the building was closer to the houses to the rear. So um, it was decided to move the building to the southern end which gave a bit more relief because you can see with the splayed boundaries, um, Mayfields Avenue is splayed away as well. So, so having the, the building here gives a little more distance uh, to the rear. The back gardens are about 14 metres in the existing houses here to about 17 there. And then we get the extra distance here and here. Um, I wouldn't pretend it's, it's not a, a close relationship at all. And you'll see in the report, we've rehearsed that very carefully. Um, is it acceptable of building this position, this scale, with that relationship? Um, you'll have seen, we've, we've noted, this sort of relationship is not uncommon at all in Portsmouth, in a densely developed city. This is a development site on a busy main road where you would expect some sort of development like this. Indeed, there's a two-storey, generously sized um, height uh, building there. Um, but the footprint over here would, of course, uh, introduce further building. But we feel, um, on balance, that relationship uh, is acceptable given the context and the, the distances are uh, a reasonable distance and they're slightly splayed away as you can see as well. Then of course you've got the quite substantial outbuildings in the back gardens which I think give real and perceived distance and separation and privacy for, for the neighbours to some degree. Um, the neighbours were happy that the uh, balconies had been removed. Um, residents were Various residents were concerned about what would happen to the boundary wall. Uh, some expressed a, a, a desire to have a taller wall. So um, I've made it clear that is uh, 
for the applicant to discuss with them if there's a collective view as to what sort of boundary it may be, indeed if there is a new one, and what height it may be. And um, we have a condition to control that anyway, but the applicant has been encouraged to speak to neighbours first to see if a, a collective view can be, can be reached on that. Otherwise, um, issues of, of highways have been addressed, as I mentioned a bit earlier, with the access. Um, the, the parking is a little bit short, two spaces sport, short of your guidance, but given the uh, central location in Portsmouth with good access to public transport and a range of facilities locally, including parks and shops and so on, um, we didn't think um, that was a matter that should withhold consent. There is uh, a 100% parking plus one um, for the site. Um, Otherwise, the main other issue is affordable housing and the scheme's viability that members may have noticed. Um, this application was due to come in April. It was deferred because after publication of the report, the applicant realised that actually um, he couldn't, in, in the end, uh, afford the affordable housing that was requested by policy. Um, and so we have spent the uh, summer and autumn working through um, quite uh, detailed matters of finance. Um, has been the to and fro of, of reports and assessments of finance that is normal in these circumstances between the applicant and our consultant. Um, in the end, we have settled upon um, our consultant's <coughs> final views that the scheme uh, is profitable um, and so could, in theory, be some money for affordable housing, but at 5.4% profit, um, that is way below the, uh, the 15 to 20 percent profit that is accepted and is set out in guidance, planning guidance. Um, so on that basis alone, it seems unreasonable to, uh, to try and uh, get the scheme to pr provide some element of affordable, it, regrettable, but um, it's way below what is deemed a normal profit level, taking account of risk and lending and so on. However, um, in the legal agreement that we have also for nitrates, um, in the event that uh, the scheme has actually built, because at the moment the finances are predicting how much the construction costs would be, how much the flats would sell for, etc., etc. Obviously, uh, as it comes to completion, um, the actual finances will be adjusted to reflect what has actually happened. Um, and should profit <coughs> extend beyond that 5.4%, the legal agreement has a review mechanism where uh, some of that further profit could be directed or would be directed towards affordable housing. So that's an important um, caveat to, to the otherwise position at present that it can't afford affordable housing. Just to give the conclusion for, for nitrate, as well as has been briefly mentioned, again, uh, discussions have occurred, but in light of the viability of the scheme, the alternatives of meeting nitrate neutrality within the scheme itself are clearly not going to be available, and consequently access to the nitrate bank is again the solution for this application. Uh, the amount of uh, financial contribution uh, available for that, again, obviously, is not great in light of the viability of the scheme, so a matter of negotiation and uh, in the 106 agreement, and obviously associated with the same clawback procedure uh, for viability review. Uh, I would take the opportunity to highlight on this application, comes up on the next one as well, uh, it does have a one-year implementation period. This is to ensure our nitrate credits are taken advantage of uh, rather than sitting uh, on an unused for, for a prolonged period of time. So as well as the standard condition preventing occupation until the mitigation scheme has been secured, uh, we further require uh, water efficiency, that's one of the conditions built into it, uh, and we do require that the scheme is commenced. We can't control when the scheme is of course completed. Uh, but we do require that the scheme is commenced uh, with no delay to ensure uh, that we do get back on track with our housing delivery and our nitrate credit bank is working, working in an efficient way. You have received the, or many of you have seen the, now the letter from Kimberly Barrett of O'Keefe Milton Green. I noticed that she has actually appeared in the audience. Um, would you wish to come to the table and put any, say anything in addition to your letter? Well, come to the table if you want to say anything briefly, but please keep it brief because you <laughs> press the right hand button. Um, 
obviously I'm hoping that you all got the email that I sent. Um, just to say briefly, initially residents weren't so concerned by the residents who are close by on Maylands Avenue, um, which I completely understand because I do feel it does encroach onto their property quite significantly. People only need to look out the window and they'll see straight into their back gardens and possibly into the properties as well. But people didn't tend to object purely because there was already an existing use there of a pub, but also because it, we saw that there was the affordable housing put there. Whether it was going to be up to nine, that was a question. But we saw that and we accepted that that was a good way to use the uh, uh, what was existing there or to build onto it. It is so disappointed to be sat here again arguing that you know these EVAs are being used to for it's a loss to residents it's not the developer who's walking away they don't think about this they've got their money profit whatever it is they've gone it's our residents that are suffering because of this we've got a huge waiting list um, for the council we've got people who could vacate council homes going into part rent part buy homes or their social housing and it's our city that's losing out for this and I'm so disappointed that once again that a developer is getting away without providing what they legally should for the city. I know that they're only getting 5.4%, but 5.4% is profit. And it's our residents, not just in Milton, but across the area, that are going to lose out because we're, there's no money coming in, it looks like, and there's no housing there. And it's just really disappointing that I have to sit here again and the fact that this city is losing out on affordable housing. I only have to remind you that Kingston Prison got nothing. The seafront, we got nothing from there as well. And it's just a continuing pattern. And I understand it's not... Um, something that the planning committee can necessarily refuse on because of these reasons but I think it really needs to be highlighted that this keeps happening and it's not fair it's us as a city that loses out and that's really what I want thank to say thank you very much <laughs> you shouldn't go oh. the committee gave you the option of, of adding to what Sorry. because you, you said you weren't coming okay uh, so, Mr. Holman, uh, you have six minutes to address the committee. Thank you. Um, an important point to start, there was a perspective drawing and there is concern on the massing that maybe the elevational treatment didn't show, so I don't know if it is on the, um, the slides, the perspective, just to show, okay, because just in the con conversation in regard to the adjacent building and uh, the massing and the perspective was showing the relationship, I thought it might have been uh, an important point, but um, okay, right. Um, even though the applicant is aware that there is a recommendation for approval, he is requested we represent him today as we believe it demonstrates the importance of this planning application. The applicants have appointed ourselves HRP Architects to prepare a residential development scheme comprising 12 units, 13 parking spaces, cycle stores and refuse facilities. The applicant has submitted two pre-application designs and had written feedback in August and September 2018. <coughs> It's been requested during this process to locate the building to the south of the site, which is what has been proposed, having previously been situated to the north, thus creating a more sympathetic relationship to the dwellings on the west and Maylands Avenue. The proposed site plan shows the distance between the existing dwellings and proposed block as being over 21 metres. The car park has now been positioned to the north, with landscaping proposed along the whole frontage of the site as requested by the LPA following the consultation with highways. The scheme presented before you is fundamentally the scheme upon which was initially submitted as a full application in December 2018, and the planning officer was positive in regard to the proposal in terms of its character, appearance, improving the quality of the street scene, high quality materials and design. The proposal conformed to all local and national policies in regard PS13, PS10, PS, PSC, PCS14, 17 and 21. The access to the north of the site is a positive change as highways have stated. The pre-application consisted of 13 parking spaces for 15 dwellings, which could not be supported. It was understood the reduction to 12 dwellings with the same amount of parking and increased cycle facilities in the sustainable location could be supported. 
The planning officer requested additional cycle storage, which has been added to the proposal, and the client to further enforce the application's compliance with the local planning policy, commissioned an independent viability study, which added further support to the applicant's development appraisal, highlighting a negative surplus in regard to the requested sum for the affordable housing. The client has acknowledged and would agree suggested to an off-site contribution for bespoke disabled dwelling, the sum of which is to be confirmed. The existing building requires maintenance and currently has no long-term future with the public house having been closed for nearly two years. In the time, the client has had health and safety concerns due to the dilapidated state of the building and vandalism as an expressed on several occasions concern and permission to demolish the building. The proposals will result in the creation of much needed residential dwellings, helping deliver the requirement whilst all in accordance with local and national policy. The application was due for a decision in March 2019 and we've waited quite some time for the opportunity to present this case today. We believe the minor objections raised in neighbours has no material consideration and we hope we have provided a robust case and in the circumstances we consider that your planning officer's report and recommendation are comprehensively presented and trust this will be permitted. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Members, questions? Uh, Councillor Atkins. Um, <clears throat> I uh, noted in the report one of the objections uh, from I think the row of houses behind um, mentioned continuing um, the wall from the petrol station. I, I don't necessarily think that's a particularly uh, fantastic idea and I'm not sure all the residents would like that but were any discussions or any conversations, did anything take place about some sort of hedging or barrier between uh, on, on the back to provide extra privacy for the houses behind or would that likely further negatively affect the, the light amenity. Um, were those conversations had, were there consultations with some of the objecting residents behind about whether or not there should be some kind of barrier, privacy barrier between the two sites? Thank you. Yeah, as, as I said earlier, um, once it became clear that that was an issue for, for more than just two or three uh, residents, um, I, I th it was most appropriate to put that back to the applicant and say, can you liaise with the residents and see what uh, w would come of that? In any event, we've got the boundary condition. Um, I think it may be complicated by um, if the rear boundaries, I don't know if, if the rear boundary to the site belongs to the applicant in terms of responsibilities or, or each individual uh, owner of the uh, gardens. Of course, you can still put one boundary on the inside of the site. Um, but again, we've got a boundary condition to deal with that. The applicant can, if not already, can go on and speak to the neighbors in the event of a consent, see if there's some sort of consensus or if there are a variety of um, treatments would be required. I, I think it would be better to have a consensus and, um, and deal with that. Uh, the boundary is behind the outbuilding, so it's, it's not much of it actually um, revealed to each individual uh, homeowner besides their outbuilding. Some outbuildings are across the full width of the site of, of the individual gardens, some have a little gap. Um, so uh, I, I don't think it's, it would make a massive difference to the neighbours. Um, we'd also uh, look carefully at um, introducing a boundary on the um, southern side as well in this sort of area um, to discourage any member of the public nipping down the side uh, in terms of site security. It's a bit more difficult to achieve on, on this side, um, but I think we, uh, from recollection I discussed that with the applicant and we had a, a fence there to at least secure that part of the site is secure. This of course is open but will be lit. Um, so I think it's something to work on a bit further, Councillor, to, 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 to reach a, a happy compromise. Councillor Pitt. Uh, thank you, Chair. A couple of questions, all of which are interrelated around the viability, <coughs> and it's, it, it's implied in the report but it's not implicit. Are we saying that the only way we would seek a contribution off-site is if the profit margin achieved by the de development being built out actually reached 17.5 percent or are we saying that we would seek that contribution were it to be greater than what is currently forecast at 5.4 percent the latter of those so should it get the, de the developers prepared to develop on these finances effectively um, although these are our adjusted figures so beyond that we're saying right if you're prepared to develop like that beyond that um, we would like to take a share of that further profit beyond the 5.4 percent for affordable housing okay uh, second of three there was reference made in the deputation about an off-site uh, disability ad adaptive flat 
contribution of some nature that doesn't seem to be in the report? I think that's come out of the discussions between the housing officer and myself that I've passed on to the applicant. This is where the, the spending could go. Even a limited amount of spending could nevertheless, you know, a thousand, two thousand pounds could still make a contribution. To example, um, uh, a disability uh, refurbishments of a flat. That's the example, but that's the sort of thing that could happen should any uh, money finally be derived from it. But at present, there's no, there's, there, there is none. Okay, and then the third question I'm guessing is probably more for Ian. Around, um, Ms Barrett raised the, um, the issues on this, around this sort of development, where is the balance between us having an expectation of delivering affordable housing and the developer choosing to build something which does not make that viable? There is no simple answer, unfortunately, uh, to this. If we feel that the scheme has come forward that is deliberately designed in such a way to you know, prevent viability uh, and thus to thus prevent the delivery of affordable housing, uh, we would have to look at that very carefully with its compliance for our affordable housing policy. However, that's fairly unlikely. Obviously, a developer is in this to make the money out of the scheme, uh, and as soon as there is a profit above a uh, reasonable level, we would require the contributions to affordable housing. No developer would want to generally risk a, a break-even scheme just to avoid the affordable housing uh, issue. Each and every case is a matter of its own factory degree, its own, its own negotiation, uh, of course. Um, but it's that uh, fundamental question. If we are confident in the viability appraisal that has been made, and we do in this case, we've had it independently verified, uh, we can either have nothing on the site and continue with the site uh, undeveloped, or we can have some housing uh, on the site. Uh, and if there is any money to, to be derived from it, we put a mechanism in place, which will become common practice, I should stress. Now we put a mechanism in place to ensure any additional additional profit that above the level that the developer has individually said is acceptable uh, is uh, captured for the benefit of affordable housing provision. And is that, therefore, Ian, is it reasonable to say that because of the consideration on this particular scheme that's been given to the neighbours in Maylands Avenue uh, and about the relationship of the building for the, for the adjacent buildings and wanting to create a sense of space and not uh, an over-concentration, that the applicant could, had none of those things been a consideration, got more units on the site, but in reaching a balance, they are where they are. It's quite a large hypothetical, but yes, uh, the scheme is designed to be the best scheme from a design and delivery point of view, uh, and then, because affordable housing is tenure blind as an opportunity, uh, the opportunity is examined otherwise. If it wasn't constrained in the same way, a different scheme, a different site, could have offered a different affordable housing contribution. We're, we're satisfied that this scheme is acceptable in its own merits, and unfortunately that consequently means it doesn't currently have the viability to support affordable housing. Thank you. Councillor Atkins, Councillor Stubbs, Councillor Smythe. Uh, just to clarify on these plans, the green areas to the rear of the property then, are they discrete gardens belonging to specific flats or are they communal space around the back of the building? Um, they're shown as communal. Um, uh, that's really up to the applicant, I think. Um, sometimes we wonder whether or not we ought to cordon something off, for example, here, because you could have uh, communal use and that wouldn't be very good for the occupier of that unit um, but often really it's, it's up to the to the developer to work it out for themselves um, I'm not sure many people would want to come and sit out some side someone else's window um, you have got Milton Park nearby you've got the cemetery nearby as well it, it was more for the implications if, if there was some sort of agreed boundary measure to protect pri privacy for example hedging or something well that would actually be in the control of those gardens if there were private mm. gardens, whereas it would be in the control of the management company if, if there was a communal space. So, well, Thank you. But we do have the landscape condition and the boundary treatment condition, uh, which normally is focused around the perimeter of the site uh, for the boundaries, but we can certainly look at that, whether or not there's any fur further uh, subdivision or privacy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I've been sitting here for a little while wondering if I should make a non-declaration of interest declaration, and I think I will. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but I think that this um, particular location may be displaying an, an election banner in support of Donna Jones yes. and her agent. And it's next door, I think. It, it's next door, is it? I think it's next door. Oh, it's next door. Don't oh, forget it then. It's next door. I think <laughs> Councillor Lee Hunt would have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Smythe. 
Um, I wanted to ask a question in relation to uh, affordability as well. Um, this is a hypothetical, but would it be possible for a developer to put uh, excessively expensive um, fittings and fixtures in a um, um, building, gold bath taps come to mind, um, and in order to avoid the affordability thing, and, and would our consultant, who we've employed to look at this, be on to that kind of thing? Yes, is the short answer. So that's why we have independent consultants to look at fairly standardised build rates, which include all the way through to fixtures and fittings, uh, and no way suggesting this is the case for this application, but in a hypothetical scenario, uh, a developer may well wish to uh, exaggerate the cost of development and to suppress uh, the cost of sales. Again, not suggesting that's the case here, but that's why we have them independently verified. Thank you, because it is disappointing. Uh, Councillor Pitt. Um, yeah, I do want to bring this one up before because it was on a different subject, but the, on the parking, um, I'm a bit concerned about the top left parking space because the only reasonable way to park in that is to drive into it. How does then somebody get out of it and out onto the main road again without having to reverse out? Um, all the other spaces, it would appear, do leave enough space for somebody to get out in some way and drive out forwards. I can't see where you get out forwards from that top left parking space. Peter, can you help? At uh, the top left parking space, you drive in forwards um, on the right hand side of the uh, aisle width, turn left into the space, and the aisle width is then wide enough for you to reverse straight back out behind you and turn left and come out forwards. Really? Yes. I'm tempted to say I'll try it with my tank. <laughs> it meets the design standard for a car parking layout. Okay, members, Councillor Hunt. Could I just ask, so the, the total amount of money that will come to the local authority to get round, as it were, the nitrates thing is about £50,000, is that about right? No. Um, so no. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, the scheme has has no uh, viability to make any direct contributions at all. Um, so, uh, because only making 5.4% uh, profit, which is a minimum amount of profit to be deemed acceptable, um, it will be the final amount will be a matter of negotiation. Um, but it may well be significantly less um, uh, to a uh, de minimis amount uh, of contribution at all for the nitrate credits. And affordable housing would come first. And affordable housing would come first. Oh, Councillor Atkins. I was going to simply clarify this, the same point. I think uh, Councillor Smiley just clarified. It's the yeah. same money as well, isn't it, uh, for the affordable yeah. housing. So it will be how much they can afford for both that we look at. And it, it may not be more than fifty or £20,000 at most. Is that? So, yep. so the nitrates policy is not relevant here? No, it is. The nitrates policy is entirely relevant. The cost uh, to individual developers of an individual nitrate credit is a matter of individual negotiation. Uh, if they can only give us a pound for the credit, uh, we, we, we are willing to uh, provide that if they have demonstrated that's the case through their viability appraisal. So, excuse me, I'm being dim. It says on page 100 that the council... I think it's the same report. Yeah, you're on the right pub report. You are, definitely. So, it says the council mitigation strategy sets out that the credit per new dwelling will be charged at £4,345.17. Could you just tell me, for my own sake, how that works in this particular case? So that is the maximum amount we seek per unit uh, as a contribution to fully fund uh, a, a credit, um, but in the same way that well, we seek a full contribution for affordable housing, where viability means they cannot afford that maximum amount, we will negotiate a lesser amount based on the individual viability of the scheme. But that means the nitrates policy doesn't mean a fig. Surely. Because the nitrates policy is about providing the credits, not funding the credits. Uh, the funding of the credits is a separate matter uh, that we're doing through individual negotiation and the support of the housing revenue account. So we're going to add 14 new toilets, yep. 14 new sets of being stuff being water and everything being dealt with. And achieve that nitrate neutrality through the credits, real credits, real improvements elsewhere, but they may not be fully funded by this development. 
Elsewhere? Where's elsewhere? Through the, the PCC housing stock. Through the PCC, oh right. So, so not only are they getting the benefit of the nitrates credit, the benefit to the council then is that houses are provided, I presume, or homes are provided. Yes, the, 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 the developer is, uh, the benefit the council, the benefit the community gets is new homes, new development home. of the site, and the developer is, is doing so without having to make direct contribution to affordable housing or direct contribution to nitrate credits, but both are, you know, uh, secured through the overage if need be. All right. Members, comments? Chairman, uh, a couple of comments. The first ones of a personal nature and uh, probably some of your, your age will remember. Uh, this used to be a very good looking pub called the Creamorn Gardens many years ago, which had beautiful green glazed tiles, but that was not the reason I used to go in it. And it was just sad. You know, I was just like to mention it was it's a sad thing that we've lost another pub, and now Milton is down to one pub instead of four. But obviously progress. The other thing was, uh, Mr. Kimberly Barrett said, and it is right that um, we seem to get a lot of um, uh, people not uh, doing the um, social housing. And, but we were assured here by our officers that if the profitability at the end of the build is more than what uh, they're saying now, then we will ask for um, a contribution either to social housing or to the social fund, whichever we like to call it. If that's the case, and I can't see if we've got much choice, then I'd like to propose the officers' recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. But I would only disagree with you on one point. I do not consider the loss of public houses in the city to be progress. Um, Councillor Atkins, I think, was the second hand of which was up. Uh, yeah, um, I'm happy to, to second um, Councillor Joyce's uh, recommendation. Um, my, my reasoning is, yes, it is sad that, um, that this is, scheme is not likely to make a large contribution to affordable housing. It's also a shame that, um, that they're not likely to therefore also be able to contribute massively towards our nitrate reduction costs, and so those costs are borne by the Council. But um, I think given that the development is, you know, it, it's, it's six one-bedroom flats, five two-bedroom, and, and, and of that nature, we're not talking about putting a large sort of 12-bedroom mansion on this site. It is housing which is going to be at the, the lower end of the cost scale, even if it's not affordable. And I don't see a developer here who I think has attempted to manipulate the system. I see what I think is a, is a difficult site. Um, and so I think it is uh, in the best interests of, of the community that this Brownfield site that's sat unoccupied for some time is um, turned into useful housing which will benefit uh, residents of the city. And I think that's to the benefit of the city overall, including in meeting our, our housing targets. Um, I think the proposal for flats of this size of, of one parking space per flat is, is sufficient. Um, I do have my, my most significant concern is actually the privacy of the um, the neighbours in this street behind and so I do hope that the developer will liaise with those um, individuals and come to a, a satisfactory solution regarding privacy, if it could be a green solution of hedging of some nature or tree, narrow trees perhaps even, um, that would also be beneficial but um, uh, I think that is an important thing the developer needs to accomplish is, is to liaise with those residents behind. I think they will understand that they live in the centre of a busy city um, and that along the rest of this road housing and flats have been developed and so I think it is correct that this is also given over to housing and flats um, or at least an appropriate use that will benefit the city. So I think overall the benefits of this scheme outweigh the costs, including the cost to the council financially in nitrates and, and the fact we're not getting directly affordable housing out of this. Um, but uh, I personally couldn't come up with a scheme that I think would, would make better use of the site that would contribute affordable housing um, and so I'm happy to second the officer's recommendation. Well, I want to support it, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I think that we're putting the, the, the cost of housing out of the reach of so many of the people who live here in Portsmouth. It doesn't comply with policy PCS 19, affordable housing, full stop. I've read the, all the other paragraphs, I've read the EVA report and so on. However, uh, 
I don't have red lines, but I'm just going to say that there are too many of these sorts of things happening. Not only that, from what I've heard, it looks like the council is going to subsidise the actual site through the, the nitrates credit. So I don't want to support it. Probably nobody will support me, but I think we have to say that we want we want people in our city to be able to afford housing and live here. So I'm not going to support it. I'm going to propose a refusal. Okay. Uh, Councillor Luke Stubbs. I mean, I was remind um, Councillor Hunt that the nitrates policy, as written, was one adopted by Councillor Pitt. Um, and if he has concerns about how it operated, perhaps that's something that they should have discussed before bringing it in. Because you know, our role here as the planning committee isn't to set policy, it's to follow the policy set elsewhere in the council and in fact the policy set nationally and one of those is brought out very clearly in on page 96 and I just read it because I think it's really important the national planning policy framework states that the adopted plan policies are deemed to be out of date in situations where the local planning authority cannot demonstrate a five-year supply of deliverable housing sites and that applies here so actual fact uh, when it comes to residential developments we don't have a local plan we have to now follow national policies which are set in favour of um, driving development because the local plan uh, is, is out of date, because the local plan review um, has slipped behind and so we are ending up having to, uh, we, we do not have a five year land supply so we do not have a local plan. Um, the development here, I mean, I, I think substantially a lot of it's, a lot of it's pretty reasonable. Um, pubs are very obviously a dying business. Um, I think something like half it feels to me something like half of the pubs that were here 15 years ago now no longer are um, I do think that's a sad thing but it's also it's, it's inevitable um, driven by, by change driven by fewer people drinking out um, and you can see when you get closer to London and land prices are higher that the proportion is greater still because the alternative use value of the site um, is greater we're looking here at a scheme with a 5% profit margin which is actually very low I mean quite honestly I don't know, um, I, I, I wouldn't think many developers would start out from a scheme, start from nothing, not expecting to get a 5% profit margin because when you're running all of the risks of something happening, the economy exploding, there being a problem on the site, something which turns it into a loss. But uh, a 5% upside versus a quite a potentially much larger downside is a very risky business. So uh, I, I really don't think you can squeeze them a load of money out of them on affordable housing as well all you'll be doing is putting developers in the situation where sites don't get developed at all and do we really want a city pockmarked with undeveloped redundant buildings with hoardings around them left empty for years so for me this scheme is um, acceptable I think it's the best we're going to get and I'm happy to support it I would remind you, Councillor Stubbs, that this is a regulatory committee and therefore we have to consider this as being independent of the um, policies which have been laid down uh, if they are not directly relevant to planning. That's my point, but I think when Councillor Hunt was referring to um, you know, the nitrates policy and saying that he didn't like the policy, well that's, like, I might not like the policy, I might like the policy, I might not like it, but in terms of in its use here, the policy is as set. I'm really sorry Mr Chairman, I actually didn't say that and I didn't say that at all. I said it looks like the City Council might be subsidising it through that particular policy, which in fact Councillor Atkins uh, mentioned as well. Right, well that, in, in a, just to clear that up, Councillor Norton. Yeah, just a shadow, uh, Councillor Stubbs' his, his comments there. I mean, 5% seems very, very low. It's unfortunate, I think, that the social housing element isn't there, but the alternative is yet another empty, derelict site. So I think I'm in favour of um, supporting officer's recommendations here. Councillor Pitt. Um, <coughs> it's, I don't want to um, get into a, a muddling contest here because it's not yeah. necessary, but the... The developer's indicated profit 
is not the same as whether or not the scheme is viable in terms of a build. Contingency around various elements of the scheme is acceptable before the 15 to 20% profit forecast. So this scheme would be built out with a contingency. The profit is a separate issue altogether. So we are not, what we are not saying here is that there's a total cost of all the build materials and then there is 15 to 20% profit. We're saying there's a total cost of the scheme and a contingency and then a 15 to 20% profit is acceptable. That's the way it works. And I, in order to avoid the argument, could we get clarification from Ian that that is the case? I'll be honest, sir, I haven't gone through the viability appraisal myself, but yes, that is how a viability appraisal works. That is why, uh, with an overage clause, effectively, you have that certainty, because uh, if contingency uh, adjustments aren't, aren't used or greater returns are, are secured through the sale of the flats, uh, then that is the additional monies that we would be looking to extract for affordable housing in the first instance and nitrate contributions uh, should they exceed that. And I think from, from my perspective, I, uh, it's no surprise for anyone in this room that I know quite a lot about these viability assessments because I've um, been interrogating them very heavily for the last four years. And because I know that, I will support the officer's recommendations because I know that with what's effectively open book, any money that there is to be taken from this scheme to support affordable housing provision in the city and to uh, cover the nitrate contribution, if they should suddenly miraculously make a large percentage, is there for our benefit. So on a balance of risk, are we less likely to get a contribution towards affordable housing or more likely to get one by going ahead with a scheme on a site that's been redundant for two years? I think I'd rather try and get something in than nothing. Um, because the risk is that the site sits there for a long period of time where we get no contribution. It's all about how you assess the viability assessment in those terms. The other, the other part of this that's um, depressing is the fact that we appear to have a policy at the moment where the whatever the reality of the situation, it is evident that the cost of building for developers is not in line with our requirements around affordability. And we've got an opportunity to address that in the Paulson Plan coming forward. We need much better guidance in the MPPF because every time they re review the thing, they never make it any clearer. It just gets muddier. <coughs> but to, if we are honestly in a position where to build 12 units, two of them aren't affordable, in actually, it's not a complicated site. The boundary bits are, but it's a block of land you can build a building on. And if that says that it's not affordable to get a couple of units in there, mm -hmm. then we have a serious problem going forward. Mm -hmm. I just don't feel we address that problem by refusing this particular application now. We need to do it in a more strategic way because Councillor Hunt's 100% correct. We can't be subsidising developers by not asking them for a nitrates contribution, nor can we be accepting no contribution whatsoever to, towards affordable housing. But we need a policy that backs that up, and I don't think that's where we are at the moment, so I will support the officer's recommendation. Right. Come to the, to the vote. Those in, f because the officer's recommendation was proposed first by Councillor Jonas, seconded by Councillor Atkins. Those in favour of the officer's recommendation, please show. Two, three, four, five, six. Those against, please show two. The, the officer's recommendation is carried. Thank you very much. There will now be a two or three minute comfort break.
Whilst we're waiting for Councillor Stubbs to return, going back to the matter of the seafront and the decision which was made on Councillor Norton's proposition, um, this will mean that there may well have to be an occasional, occasional, over the next few years, short meetings of the planning committee at short notice because the time between the end of the of public consultation on the design features and the initiation of implementation is often very short and it would not fit into the cycle so we may have to have a one item agenda short meeting upon occasions Right, we come now to item 7, the former Knight and Lee building, 5357 Palmerston Road. Um, can I have a Mr. Meadows and Mr. Tisdale to the table, please? Do you want me to briefly mention old Daniels? Um, we, okay. yes. Members, I just mentioned we did have another deputy, uh, Mr. Paul Denyer, who had raised some concerns around highways issues. Uh, he's got a detailed representation, which I trust everyone has seen uh, yes. on the website. Uh, there was some delay in getting notification to him. Uh, he did think he could come, uh, but had to cancel that at short notice today. Uh, we do have our highway engineer here, though. If there's any questions arising from his written representations you <coughs> wish to, to examine, but I thought fair to mention that uh, due to Mr. Denyer's inability at the very short notice he was given to make his deputation today in person. Can I have the officer's report, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, just on that point, I do have a summary of the, the points raised by Mr. Denyer, if you'd like me to run through those at the end of the, the presentation. Okay, thank you. Right, so this application, and just before I begin, I'll just draw your attention to the supplementary matters sheet in front of you. Um, there is a, um, an update, just a discrepancy between the text within the report and one of the conditions just relating to the opening hours. So the application relates to the former Knight and Lee department store within Southsea Town Centre. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the site itself, uh, just sat in here with the pedestrianised section of Palmerston Road, the existing Debenham store terminating at St Jude's Church, with the centre extending <coughs> into Marmion Road running behind the, the location plan, and then the, the restaurant quarter of the the town centre extending to Osborne Road, Clarendon Road and the open section of Palmerston Road to the south. <coughs> Just some existing photographs of the site um, at the moment occupied by an impressive 1950s department store with some very interesting architectural detailing on the western elevation. Uh, this is the elevation onto Clarendon Road with the Debenham store in the background. Um, the main elevation into the precinct and this picture here, which I will return to later on, but it's worth noting uh, the existing servicing arrangements uh, from Stanley Street. Um, this is the first property, um, small two-storey terrace houses extending the length of, of Stanley Street and the existing relationship with windows on the rear section of the application site. So planning permission is sought for a mixed-use development comprising offices, hotels, food and drink, gym and cinema uses. Uh, much of the existing fabric of the building would be retained in its current form, uh, many of the original features, um, with the addition of an extension at roof level. Just working through the, uh, the floor plans, uh, we start at the basement, so there's an existing basement area which would be given over to plant, a small area of excavation to provide um, floor to ceiling height for the larger of the cinema rooms. Then at ground floor level, the other two cinema rooms um, and the, the larger screen just sitting in here. All of the existing plant and back of house facilities would be located in the same position as the existing store. The main entrances into the precinct and onto Osborne Road and Clarendon Road with four small shop units 
retained within the corners of the building. You have a large reception area that would provide facilities for food and drink uses, the entrance to an office element and the entrance into gym facilities which extends up at roof level. At first floor there would be approximately 670 square metres of flexible office space with associated um, facilities um, and wrapped around that um, on the periphery of the building um, hotel accommodation um, each with their separate accesses. The second floor very similar to the arrangement on the first floor again predominantly with office accommodation fronting onto the precinct uh, with hotel rooms located around the outside and then at roof level um, there would be the clearance of various structures and buildings that are already present up there and the construction of an additional story towards the western side of the building this section in here is an existing extension at roof level um, note the, the setback of approximately five meters of the new floor from the existing elevations around the periphery of the building. Um, at roof level um, there is an area of plant. Uh, for those of you that ever went into the building in the summer or winter months it did have problems trying to control the climate. There is a lot of plant associated with this but there are lots of uses going into the building. Um, as originally submitted the plant was going to be located in this position um, to try and reduce the impact on neighbours and from within the conservation area that has been repositioned to the centre of the building and we've worked hard with the applicant to try and minimise the impact of those facilities. So overall um, it's considered that the proposed mix of uses is considered to be compatible with this town centre location and is entirely in line with local and national planning policies. Whilst the, the nature of use will change, um, it was formerly a very large department store, um, it's considered that the impacts associated with the bar, hotel, cinema uses can be controlled by planning conditions and those are detailed within your report. Just moving on to the external alterations, again I'll try and point out, it's quite difficult to see from these images, but already there are some existing structures up at roof level. The additional story kind of nestles in amongst those uh, with the notable dis um, exception of the plant enclosure up on the roof. This is the elevation that fronts into the Stanley Street conservation area and you'll note that there is a very modest increase in the height of the building along much of these elevations, more in this area here and then the plant that will be located at the top. Elevation onto Stanley Street, very little in the way of changes at, at ground floor level, just an entrance in here. The existing facilities for servicing will be retained, and then the infill extension just sat in there. And then onto the main elevation, you'll just see that the architectural language of the building has been extended up at roof level, uh, sympathetic and set back to. Um, act as a subservient feature to the existing building. So overall in design terms it's considered that it is a sensitive addition to the building. The exception to that is the plant enclosure but is considered to be necessary and it's considered that the overall benefits of the proposal would outweigh the less than substantial harm to the character and appearance of the adjoining Stanley Street conservation area. Um, just moving on this is um, an indicative view of how the application site would um, be seen from just outside the NatWest Bank. Um, so you can see as a result of a setback, it, the impact of that additional story is reduced. You will see a little bit of the plant enclosure, certainly from longer distance views and from other positions on Clarendon Road. And as you can see from within the precinct itself, those closer views, the, the, the second story, sorry, the third floor set back from the elevations is not going to be particularly noticeable. Now just moving back to probably the two main issues for consideration um, that, that remain. Um, this earlier image that I showed you was the rear elevation of the building and the windows that front into the properties that uh, are located on Stanley Street. Um, it is worth noting though that this is an existing large building, 
um, operating previously as a shop, although there are other uses that could have operated in there with, with more of an impact than it does currently. There are no new openings on those elevations, and whilst the nature of the use will change, it's not considered that uh, an objection on overlooking or loss of privacy could be sustained on the basis that this is an existing relationship. The second main issue, and unfortunately and Mr. Daniel would probably have wanted to touch on this, and as I say, I can summarise his um, representation in more detail, um, is the impact on the surrounding highway network. But again, the starting point is this is a large department store that's already located within a town centre location. Um, the information that has been provided by the applicant is considered to be robust and proportionate to the scale of the development. And whilst there is some disagreement between Mr. Denyer and our own highways engineer, it's considered that the impact on the surrounding highway network would not be significant and there is adequate parking within a reasonable walking distance of the application site not to result in significant harm. So overall, having regard to all the material matters, it's considered that the proposal would provide a positive and ambitious development that would contribute significantly to the viability of the South Sea Town Centre area. Um, and as such, the application comes with a recommendation of conditional permission um, in line with the recommendations set out in page 85 of your report, which will be to address the matters of nitrates associated with the overnight stays of the hotel. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Mr Meadows, you have, five, you have six minutes to... Yes, you push it on the right-hand button. That's it. My name is Martin Meadows and I live in Stanley Street. Um, first of all, I accept that the development will be a good thing for the precinct and the citizens of um, Portsmouth and South Sea. However, my concern is that as a result of the development, there will be a significant detrimental effect on the amenity of on-street parking enjoyed by residents. And by that, I mean it will not be a small inconvenience. Um, I say, I call this, describe this as an amenity because it benefits each property to be able to park outside. In other words, if you couldn't do that, you would regard yourself as being a, at a considerable disadvantage. Um, these properties in Stanley Street and many local streets form part of Zone KC where um, non-residents are allowed to park for three hours. I would just say that um, initially I put my objection on the basis uh, of there being no provision made for parking. However, I did outline all relevant matters concerning the uh, significant detrimental point in that letter and I also in a later letter confirmed that that was the ground of my objection, namely significant detrimental effect. Um, and that it, it has been accepted on that basis by the planning officer as appears from the report. Um, this is a matter of considerable concern to myself and my wife. Um, she has gone as so far as to say that if the parking gets worse, we may have to consider moving, and at least one other resident has said the same thing to me. Um, parking in Stanley Street and the rest of Zone KC is difficult now. I would say that in Stanley Street, and it's difficult to be precise because I haven't sat there and carried out a survey, um, on at least one occasion in three, um, we are able to park in Stanley Street. On the other two occasions, we have to look for parking elsewhere. Um, now, at the moment, non-residents do park in Stanley Street and the remainder of Zone KC. And I think the reason for that is quite clear and logical. If they can find a space in Stanley Street, they're not going to go, whatever, 400 metres away and park uh, in, uh, in the seafront location and pay um, up to £4 till an hour. And if they can park in Stanley Street or other locations near to uh, the site of the... Uh, former John Lewis building, they will do so for reasons of convenience and um, saving expense. Um, uh, why do 
I say that non-residents park? Well, what I say it can only be, be a snapshot in time, but it's not uncommon for me to be in the street and see a car that parks and the, and the driver then sets off towards um, the precinct, or, it, or I see a driver returning with shopping, or I see um, a, a commercial van that I've never seen before parked in the street. Um, I think it's reasonable con to conclude that quite a few times in every day um, there are non residents parking in uh, Stanley Street for the reasons that I have given. As a result of, um, uh, let me first say that I would say that at least five streets um, in Zone KC are closer than most of the seafront zone appearing in the applicant's plan um, and suggested as available parking for the extra 22 or 28 um, parking places required. Um, certainly Stanley Street is, is adjacent to the site. Um, Fontwell Road is not that far away, it's alongside the John Lewis car park. The consequence, I say, of uh, creating uh, anywhere between 22 and 28 um, parking place requirements as a result of the development is that uh, many of those vehicles will try to park in Stanley Street and other parts of Zone KC. Um, I would say also that this is definitely a problem and that um, neither the applicant nor the uh, council have said uh, have um, said that there will be no such problem so I, I, I suggest it's reasonable to conclude that what I'm saying about um, uh, there being a parking problem in the future is correct. As a result of um, greater pressure on parking spaces, uh, residents who hold permits for parking in KC, Zone KC, will have to spend more time finding a parking place if they can't park conveniently to their house. It is likely to be further away. In bad weather, it will be unpleasant. And uh, at its very worst, it could result in uh, having to pay meter charges. Um, I would say that it would not be uncommon when conditions are very difficult, as I assume they will be, it would not be uncommon to have to spend uh, 15 minutes on a round trip parking a car. You're coming to the end of your time, Mr. Am I? Yes. Well, okay, well, that's, the only other things I would like to say is that in, at some time in the future, it looks likely that Avenue de Caen will be pedestrianised and that would re result in the loss of a quarter of the spaces. The other point is that some local residents are able to park in, in the Waitrose Park, but I, my understanding is only a comparatively few people who live close uh, to that car park and it's only for overnight parking, so they can't come and go during the day. So that situation exists now, it will still exist after planning consent is granted, assuming it, that it is, and therefore it has a neutral effect. Also, on that point, the um, facility that John Lewis customers had to park in Waitrose uh, car park no longer exists because the building is in different ownership from uh, the owners of Waitrose car park. Right, thank you. You have concluded. You've used up your time. <laughs> I've tried to, yes. <laughs> okay. Same. So we come on to the next deputation, uh, which is from Mr. Mark Holman. If you could press the right hand button, please, Mr. Holman. And Mr. Meadows, that's off. Sorry? Sorry, Mr. Tis. Mr. T it's all right. Yes, that's fine. It's just I'm getting old and forgetful about these things. It's been a long day, I think, for you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, when, it doesn't seem a long time ago, um, the 
the announcement of the closure of John Lewis, 23rd of January this year. Um, which I appreciate it was a very dark day for Sasi in many ways. Um, and when we were offered the opportunity to, to redevelop the building, we were at, at first unsure. Um, whilst it was, a, we think it's a tremendous opportunity for what we do um, uh, every day. Um, we were worried about being remembered as, as the guys that came along and closed the John Lewis and would never be forgiven. Um, the first few weeks were a bit bleak. Um, I think the day that it was announced, I don't think we've ever had any more inquiries to our website or our social media than that day, and my phone for that matter. Um, and as I say, it was it was pretty bleak. And one one tweet that day said, first Trump, then Brexit, now the closure of John Lewis. Um, so I, mean, I think that gives a flavour for where we were. Um, I think at the time, those that we spoke to, we tried to, to, to paint a positive picture that this would not kill South Sea. It would, um, to be wrong, it's a challenge, but it would be uh, a, a good thing in the long run. Um, so I would say 11 months on, uh, extensive consultation, certainly in, in the first half of this year. Um, our plans have emerged and we're very, very pleased with, with what we're proposing. Um, we think we tick a lot of boxes and we're providing um, many different uses within the building. Uh, you go back to the first consultation event where the main, the main thrust of that event was you need to keep John Lewis open and we don't want lots and lots of shoebox apartments um, in the building and I think people can now see that, that what we'll be offering should we be successful is a broad range of facilities for the local community. Um, and. You know, take take the emotion of John Lewis out of the equation. Uh, we sincerely believe that what we're proposing is better in the round than what was there before. Um, and don't get me wrong, if I live around the corner, I'd like there to be John Lewis on my street. But that's out of all of our hands. So we we we, we move forward. Um, we've been involved in are involved in a lot of retail evolution projects at the moment. It's one of the things we're doing a lot of, and. Um, very few have such good prospects as this particular building, given the site, the, the location, and the, the the community around the site. Um, so this is a unique opportunity. Um, we are very confident that we will create a, a very busy building, um, day in, day out, and a much more steady flow of people across the week um, than perhaps the John Lewis, with which had more peaks and troughs. Um, and given the the uses and the the, 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 what, the, the design we're approaching, um, we think it's got longevity. And obviously, the John Lewis and other nearby buildings don't have that, unfortunately. Um, we have done in our business. We've done the principal elements of the scheme before. We've done them well: food and beverage, events, hotel, workspace. You know, this is not new for us. Um, we appreciate this is a very, very special building. It's much loved. Um, I'd like to assure members that um, we, we consider the building to be in very safe hands. We have a, a team of creative young people champing at the bit to get this done and, and make it very special. And also, we have a, a long list of office users, small retailers. Um, independent businesses who would like to come along and join in with what we're doing, uh, principally in the in the, the lower floors plus for the offices above, um, and for a scheme that doesn't even have planning, um, yeah, that's frankly that's unprecedented. Um, so we're very confident that we'll be able to fill the building. Um, we have we have people waiting for for, for calls this afternoon. Um, should we be successful? Um, and I. I have to say, as a team, we're very, very confident that we'll look back upon this in time to come and this change, and we'll say that it's the best thing that could have happened. And um, if successful, we will ensure that it is. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much to the deputies. Um, members, questions? Councillor Smythe. I just. Uh, Pursuing um, what you said, that you would give us a little bit of an outline of what um, the other um, um, Mr. Din Den 
Mr. Denier. Yes, what he said. Just an outline, because I can't um, concentrate on what's being said and look it up on the, online. Okay, just to summarise um, Mr. Denier's representation, um, which was detailed, um, and a full response to that um, representation has been provided and is available online that has been um, delivered by our own highways engineer uh, representing the local highways authority. So as a, as a very brief summary of the points that were raised within the representation um, and in no particular order, um, so it's concerns that the application had not been properly considered by the local highways authority, uh, but the bar, restaurant, cinema and the gym uses will increase parking demand within the West South Sea residential parking zone um, in the evening and overnight. Um, but servicing demands are unreasonable and will be greater than the existing use. The question why a transport assessment was not requested by the local highways authority, contrary to the supplementary planning document. Uh, the survey evidence for the parking accumulation was lacking. Um, it appeared that the applicant had been offered greater latitude than perhaps uh, Mr. Denyer had in support of other applications that he had um, provided consultancy advice on. Um, that the short stay visitors would use the West South Sea parking zone. Um, that surveys did not include mid morning and mid afternoon. Um, that survey area was greater than the 400 metre area suggested by the highways engineer. Uh, the local highway authority have not considered the combined impacts with the sea defence works, uh, that no justification for the assumption of the site being within a highly accessible location had been provided. Um, the parking, uh, forgive me, uh, the parking requirements for the back of house gym uh, facilities was unrealistically low. No provision for electric vehicles or drivers with disabilities, and no potential, uh, no assessment of the potential use of the offices at the weekend had been provided. Thank you, Councillor Udi. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm asking this on that on that ground floor plan. Is the escalator staying in the ground floor? So I obviously I can't see it from a bit, it kind of looks like it might still be there in that picture. Okay, that, that on, the, on the submitted drawing is an indication that the, the escalator would be retained. Um, the building is not listed and therefore th there are no uh, planning requirements for the retention of those facilities. Um, but as part of uh, the sympathetic design that the applicant is indicating, that I think it is within their uh, desire to try and retain that if possible. Um, and the applicants there, if, if you'd like to question him. I swear like, I'd read somewhere something about that escalator specifically being very old and having a history behind it, so it was qu it's quite nice to see. It clanked beautifully. Right, whilst we're waiting a question from the chair. The hotel rooms on the eastern flank, i.e. to the top of your drawing, Do those hotel rooms have any natural light at all, or is it uh, because it doesn't appear that they do from the plans? Those hotel rooms do not have um, natural light and ventilation to those. Those will be um, mechanically ventilated. Um, it's not unusual. Um, I've stayed in hotel accommodation myself. Um, it depends on the hotel user and, and what their target market will be. Uh, chair, come on. Uh, Yes, if, if it's a factual point, yes. Yes, we're, we're um, very close to a, um, finding a solution for that with sun pipes into those rooms. Not on these plans, okay. but, but FYI. Yes. This committee knows about sun pipes. <laughs> we have, we've seen them before. Councillor Pitt? It might be me, but I'm a little bit confused about the, cons the, the parking concerns around this, because KC Zone has a three-hour parking limit. Yep. So therefore that's going to be no good whatsoever to anybody staying overnight in a hotel. It's going to be no good whatsoever to anybody going to work in the building during the day and therefore presumably was not an issue with previous employees of the building either. It would only be an issue with people going to short-term visits in that building 
and this building wasn't sold by Knight and Lee because it was unprofitable. It was sold because it couldn't be adapted to their current trading model, I believe, from what they've said in the press, which can only evidence that it had decent footfall. So I'm really not getting the parking thing here at all because there is on-street parking that people would have to go and pay for uh, or they would have to buy business permits at some, quite, some quite considerable expense. I'm not... I just... Am I missing something here? Um, in short, no. Um, I, I tend to believe um, that there is an, a large existing building on that site that had significant footfall. I don't know the details of why the store left, but it wasn't to, uh, because of a lack of footfall going to it. So during the day, there would have been trips and link trips to the centre um, that would have had its own associated trip demand and parking demands. Um, the, the significant difference, I suppose, will be in the evenings and over the weekends, which is associated with the hotel use. And, and as you indicate, there is limited uh, waiting within those KC zones, which would prevent people from parking there overnight, which is why the, the survey has focused on the areas beyond those zones um, where there is on-strike provision. Um, it's a little bit further than perhaps you would expect for a residential development, but this is not a residential development. This is a hotel where it's expected that perhaps people would be willing to walk a little bit further to find a parking space associated with a hotel. Um, the highways engineer is here if, if you do want to sort of him to expand on that at all. So, linked to that, my understanding is that the seafront hotels are able to get an, a limited number of permits, admittedly, but for uh, business, uh, for, for them to use as a business, for people to park at a, a cost on the seafront. Is, is, um, would this qualify? For um, I don't know about the details of being able to get reduced parking costs within the pay and display areas. Um, we have checked to see whether the hotel would be entitled to permits within the residence parking zone, and the answer to that is no, um, because of the number of rooms associated with the hotel. That is the case with smaller guest houses, but not with larger hotels. Okay, that's helpful. Councillor Hunt, question? Sorry? Okay, comments, Councillor Hunt, to start with then. So I think that the applicants must have been taking the town, South Street Town Centre application, sorry, Town Centre action plan to bed with them, to read it, because uh, it fits the whole of that document. Um, the uh, report shows us that, uh, that it, it requires that uh, we create a safe, thriving, attractive town centre with a unique and lively atmosphere and goes on to say protect the built heritage of the area and as we can see from the reports today uh, all of those things are achieved with this so I'm very grateful to it I, I don't th you know I very rarely went into Knight and Lee I couldn't afford to go in there quite frankly and I wouldn't afford to go in there despite what other people might say and be unhappy about it's so, so expensive for me and so I'm really glad that, um, not that it's closed because it's an icon for the city, but things change. And this was envisaged back in 2007 uh, when the um, Southie Town uh, uh, Action Plan uh, went through it, pointed out that uh, retail was, uh, was um, changing and that South Sea had dropped 100 places already in the rankings across uh, England and Wales in retailing. So there's a very good opportunity here to push South Sea back up those rankings and indeed the city's crying out for good quality hotel and hotel rooms with decent rooms at decent prices because we've got things like the Great South Run, we have um, uh, all sorts of events on the seafront and uh, other things like um, the Victoria's Festival so I don't doubt for one moment that this hotel <coughs> it should be a great, attract, uh, gr a great help to um, South Sea. Of course, one regrets the uh, passing of um, anchor stores, but equally, we need to sustain retailing nowadays. You need these creative and cultural anchors. That is the way forward for our shopping centres and our district centres. Imaginative, creative, cultural anchors. This looks like it's going to achieve it. I think we should be relieved, and I hope people across South Sea will be relieved, 
that we've got somebody coming in so quickly to do so much good work. When I first saw the picture that came up there and I saw that little run around the top, it gave it that nice sort of retro decorate look to the building, which we're going to see in a moment. So it's lifted the building up already, and it's quite a striking building, isn't it? You know, particularly on a sunny day. Uh, so um, I think uh, I'm very uh, content to uh, to um, move the officers' recommendations. Um, I think it's an opportunity for South. It's very sad that Knightley have gone. It's very sad that Debenhams are closing down. But when something dies, something always comes. And the great thing about this city is it always rises. Something always comes out of it. And that's been the, the, one of the great strengths of our city. And um, this I hope, and I'm sure, I just feel sure listening today, I can't guarantee it, but I just feel sure today that the, uh, a lot of good will come out of this uh, demise of Knight and Lee. Do I have a seconder? A seconder is Councillor Stubbs. Do you wish to speak at this point, Councillor Stubbs? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, just to go back to the uh, South Sea Town Centre Action Plan dating, well, I think it says in the report it's 12 years old. Um, it's, it was sort of accurate and wasn't at the same time because while it did indeed um, make reference to a decline in retail in South Sea Town Centre and look towards whatever uses might be possible, the assumption behind that was because a million square feet of retail was going to be built in the city centre um, and that was what was going to have the effect, but of course, in the intervention, in time, um, the world has changed dramatically, um, and as it is, we've ended up with a decline in the city centre um, and a decline in the South Sea. But I guess that's that's just the, the world we live in today. Um, the application, though, we have is is very good. Look, let's be realistic about this as well. If an application had come in to convert the whole thing into flats with a small amount of active frontage around the side, we would have to give it, and if we didn't give it, it would go straight for on appeal. So that's the starting point for um, assessing any application and in fact this one is a lot better than that I mean it brings in all sorts of positive uses employment uses other things which will continue to drive footfall into South Sea Town Centre and it is noticeable by the way that the footfall for, for um, Palmerston Road is down 16% year on year which is an awfully big drop um, and you know it probably does reflect the closure of that store um, and we may well see when when Debenhams closes next year a, fur a further sizable drop but um, at least we've got something here uh, which gives um, hope that the that, that other people will come into the area to take their place, that we've been moving towards this cafe model. There's any number of places where you can buy um, a coffee within a quarter of a mile of there. But, of course, for those businesses to be viable, you've got to be there in the first place. It's got to be something to bring you in. And I suspect a coffee shop on its own might not be enough. So having something which provides some movement there, some reason to come to the area, um, it's a very good thing. I do take the point about parking, but as I said, if this was a housing scheme, realistically, um, we would be granting it. So, you know, this is, this is a, a good outcome. Councillor Norton. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to sort of shadow again what, what's been said today, um, I, I'm not massively convinced that a small screen cinema and a hotel with you know no parking or no natural light can work there however i will hope uh, you know that we have, have re relentless optimism that this can be marketed in such a way and, and and really really be popular because i think the rest of it is is fantastic um, it seems like a, a really sensible uh, application here but the, the the huge success will be the quick turnaround i think to get this done you know and, and through within a year it is it's fantastic so i think i'm going to support Count, sorry I'll, I'll, I'll I'll yes i know you did <laughs> councillor Uli first then councillor pitt um, I've, I've got a few points i'm trying not to be really negative about it at all because i really i do support the scheme um, quite a lot. Um, as someone who's about to submit a PhD idea on film, I'm so desperate for another cinema in Portsmouth, it's unreal. I did make a point during our planning briefing yesterday, I was like, why can't it close at like 2 3 in the morning? Because like, I'm a fan of midnight screenings, but apparently that's not going to work. And I'm chair of licensing, and I think my licensing officers would be very upset <laughs> if that happened <laughs> as well. Um, uh, with South Sea, um, whilst we have the figures about 16% down year on year on trading, um, I wrote an article um, for a local news website about um, 
the, je the death of John Lewis is the evolution of the high street because we're looking to more cultural means and you, you've, you, you just knew what was happening and you just hit the nail on the head and you're coming in and South Sea is vastly becoming kind of like the cultural capital of the city. Um, Debenhams is going and I don't see particularly too much pain over it. I did used to joke for people that have been to Beguine and Berlin that we could have a South Sea Beguine, that'd be really cool, but that wouldn't happen. Um, but um, I just want to make a point that I feel like South Sea High Street uh, in general is kind of not really like a high street anymore and it has evolved and it's evolving into something else and that we need to save high streets in Portsmouth but let's keep the nice, well not the nice lovely stuff but like the ca cultural capital is obviously going to be South Sea but we need to be looking northwards in the city right now but thank you for giving us a cinema that's what I'm really happy about which is... <laughs> I'm not sure why you shouldn't have declared an interest at me finishing a PhD on film. <laughs> but there we are. Uh, Councillor Pitt. Um, thank you, Chair. I was going to um, pick up on what Claire said, actually. We have a, a very successful um, independent uh, film uh, profile in the city. Um, number six does very well in uh, action stations in the historic dockyard. Um, but uh, as members may be aware, there is a uh, desire to raise enough money for that to become the Seymour Royal Marines Museum, and there has been ongoing uncertainty <coughs> as to whether or not Number 6 will continue to stay there, if that was the case. Portsmouth Film Society have long wanted a, a base in the city as well, uh, and do pull regular numbers. There's, obvious, there's other groups uh, who do annual projects, such as DV Mission, there's the Making Wave Film Festival that happen every year, and having three small spaces co-located gives a fantastic opportunity to those groups so you know having that co-location and that and it being in South Sea every single one of those groups has expressed an interest in finding somewhere in in the, in the heart of South Sea to be able to do that so I'm really hoping that those groups do step forward and take the make the maximum opportunity of this uh, offer being available there it's great to see the other thing is that we know that co-working spaces uh, have been very successful in other parts of the country um, we have a very limited amount of that in the city at the moment and if you're going to put it anywhere you want it in the creative heart of the city which is definitely South Sea. Um, the ability to retain for retail units on this space I think are, is really important because it keeps the active frontage and keeps people going in and out. Um, the opportunity for people to, to meet and discuss. People don't just sit in office environments anymore, they sit in cafes. If you go to somewhere like Galar's Lounge in Albert Road, you'll see just as many people having business Civic. meetings. Civic. Um, and also, as, as uh, Councillor Hunt just pointed out, we planning committee had lunch downstairs. There was people having business meetings as well as there were people having, uh, just sitting and having, having something to eat. Um, so I think yeah. the flexibility of it, all right, um, <laughs> the pizzas are good downstairs for the sake of record and they're reasonably priced. Uh, something to note, either, perhaps. Um, but um, flexibility is what we need and we <coughs> need the massive double, triple shop fronted places which go miles back and include vast storage. All the evidence says that they are not where we will be in 10 to 15 years time. We need to be much lighter on our feet around that and the stores will want to showcase their offer but they will not necessarily want to store tons of it out the back they'll do that via um, out, uh, you know, out of city locations where they'll uh, pick up their online orders at the same time so everything is changing and this application as Councillor Hunt said earlier picks up on some of the things that were forecast and uh, admittedly we'd all like to have seen the northern quarter developed at that point but thank god it wasn't because half of it would be empty now um, and we've moved on to a, a different place this building could have been micro flats, the worst Luke and I's dreaded micro flats, um, where tiny little rabbit hut rooms are developed for people to live in, and there's nothing we could have done about it in terms of planning. If we'd rejected it here, the regional inspector would have overturned us. That was, I attended a couple of the consultation events that Peter held, that was what the public said they didn't want. They massively did not want student flats on that site, and I think if the application was sat there for student flats now, we'd all be really cross about it, but we might not be able to stop it. We've got somebody who's come forward with a scheme that you know, lot, everyone on this committee said something positive about today, uh, and that 70% of the public from the circular that we all received um, seem to have been positive about as well. We might not get that opportunity again. We need to grab it with both hands, in my view. Councillor Janice. 
I'd just like to agree with um, my colleagues and, uh, and I will be voting for this and I'm a little bit more optimistic about the um, uh, the uh, hotel side of it. People pay hundreds of pounds to have an inboard cabin on a cruise and they don't see the light of day or anything so I'm sure a night in a hotel room in Palmerston Road won't be too much to worry about. <laughs> Councillor Atkins. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add, add my voice in support of this application. I think it's a, it's a really good application. I like the fact that given the developing nature of the high street, it, it incorporates a variety of different uh, options. And, and if some of those are more successful than others, then more of the site can be given over potentially in the future to, to that scheme. So it, it, if you like tests, a variety of different options, I think that's a really healthy way to approach this kind of development. And so I'm, I'm keen to support it. Councillor Smith? Um, I, I would like to support this application as well. I'd like it to be started really quickly as well. Not as quickly as I would like it to be supported. I'm coming up for re-election. <laughs> um, okay. Members, members in favour of the proposal have been, which has been proposed by Councillor Hunt and seconded by Councillor Stubbs, please show. That is unanimous. You have your planning application permission. We look forward. Members, that concludes the formal business. I would remind you that there is a meeting of the planning committee after this meeting to look at the development of the city plan uh, and that will commence as soon as the public gallery is cleared.